Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to the Safer Internet Forum 2021. Um, I think the past 18 months has highlighted the importance of technology in all of our lives. Uh, we've used it to stay in touch with family and friends, and many of us have been able to carry on working from home, uh, which is a blessing and a curse, perhaps. Uh, and of course, children and young people have been able to continue their education. But I think we've also become increasingly aware of the challenges associated with the online world, and particularly so for children and young people. Um, it really is wonderful to see so many people attending today and you're all really, really welcome. Uh, we've got colleagues here from across the world who represent a range of different stakeholder groups. Uh, and I think it really says something about the importance of the issues that we'll be discussing, that we've had over 670 people register for the event um, from over 68 different countries. Last night um, at a pre-event, which I know many of you attended, June Larry Kingston from the European Commission reminded us of what the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said when she proposed to make next year, 2022, the year of European youth. And she said, if we are to shape our union in their mould, young people must be able to shape Europe's future. She said, our union needs a soul and a vision uh, that they can connect to. Now, those of you who attend the Safer Internet Forum regularly will know that the Better Internet for Kids Youth Panel, the BIC Youth Panel, is an integral part of the event. Um, and as usual, um, our youth panelists have been working hard for the past few months discussing a range of important topics, including the online environment for schools, social networks and advertising, and online society. And we're going to be hearing a lot from them um, throughout the next two days. You've seen um, some of the quotes from uh, young people um, as we were waiting for the forum to start, uh, and there will be more of that too. So earlier this year, um, the European Commission published a 2030 Digital Compass, uh, the European way for the digital decade. And this presented a vision, targets and avenues for a successful digital transformation of Europe by 2030. And it recognised that EU rights and values should be reflected in the online space, just as they are in the real world, and that children and young people should be placed at the centre uh, of that EU policy making. So against this background, uh, European Schoolnet, on behalf of the European Commission, consulted a number of different stakeholders on the priorities that they would see to promote, to protect, to respect and to fulfil children's rights in the digital world. Now, over 750 of these respondents were actually children and young people, and they took part in over 70 consultation sessions uh, in order to share their thoughts on digital risks, but also digital opportunities and their views of the digital future. So this pre-event last night that I mentioned, it saw the launch of a report from the consultation with children and young people. And the report is how to make Europe's digital decade fit for children and young people. And I really urge you to take time to download and read the report. Um, you know, these consultation sessions, they didn't take place last year, um, which is often the challenge of research in this field. These young people were giving their feedback as recently as August. Um, and the report highlights the crucial role that the internet plays in almost every aspect of children and young people's lives, but also the fact that challenges, including cyberbullying, hateful and harmful content, fake news and disinformation are ever present um, and something that does concern children and young people. The report gives a real insight uh, into the opportunities that uh, these young people experience online. So one quote was, I love being able to communicate with people from other parts of the world and learn something of their way of life. And another was, the internet was our most important link with the outside world during the pandemic. Um, equally, the report also talks about the challenges that young people encounter. I think crucially though, it showcases suggestions from these young people for possible solutions. Um, interestingly, many respondents suggested that the root cause of many of the online risks and challenges lies in a lack of awareness and media literacy amongst internet users. Uh, and some added that uh, it was parents and educators who needed to take their role more seriously than perhaps they do today. Um, and they mentioned that the environment that children and young people grow up in is really important. Um, so I think we need as adults, as parents, as educators to be leading by example. I just wanted to share one specific quote from the consultation with you. EC policymakers should find ways so that children's voices are heard and that cyberbullying and other electronic crime is illegal in order for children to feel that there is justice. Only then they can open up to talk when something goes wrong, because now underage users feel lonely and exposed online. 
And I add to that a comment made by one of the youth panellists, Mia, from the pre-event last night. And she said, we need policymakers and industry to make changes. Of course, it's important for us to do that too. But at the end of the day, we're children. We can do our part, but we can't make a big change in the way that you can. And she said, we hope that you've heard us and that you take something away and implement it to make the internet a safer place. So I think there's a real call to action there for all of us. So the Safer Internet Forum this year, um, it's about identifying solutions to these challenges. I think most of us are very aware of the risks, um, although of course with new and emerging tech, uh, there are always gonna be new concerns to address uh, and opportunities to embrace. So these next two days are about preparing ourselves for what we can expect over the next decade. We need to ensure that the online space is a safe space for all users, but particularly for children and young people. Now, last month, um, only a, a week or so ago, the Commission published their roadmap focusing on a new European strategy for a better internet for children. Many of you will know that the original strategy was published in 2012, uh, and it's protected and empowered children online through a range of EU funding, coordination and self-regulation. But almost 10 years have passed, and so it's right to update that strategy uh, in order to reflect the changes in children's use of digital tech and the acceleration of the digital transformation and, of course, lifestyle changes and related health issues which have been exacerbated by the pandemic that we've all been living with. The current strategy um, has four pillars, uh, and in the agenda over the next two days, we've designed it with these pillars in mind, whilst also incorporating a balance between protection and empowerment, which we'll hear a lot more about. So the forum is going to seek to inform the update to this strategy with a range of speakers who are going to look to the future and suggest what needs to be done to address some of the challenges that have been highlighted by children and young people. So just a few housekeeping rules to remind you of before we start. Um, as you will have seen now, uh, we have sign language interpretation for this keynote session and for the closing session. We've also got closed captioning uh, throughout, including in the deep dives, uh, and there should be information in the chat for those who want to enable uh, the closed captioning. We're using the Teams live event um, for this main plenary session uh, in order to be able to accommodate the large numbers of participants that we have. But if you'd like to ask a question or comment on what you're hearing, then we do have a chat Q&A sort of facility which will be monitored throughout the various sessions. And I would really encourage you to start discussions and share your thoughts and ideas there. We're going to move to Teams webinar for the deep dives um, because that will provide more opportunity for interaction uh, and more active contribution to the discussions. Um, we have seven deep dives in total uh, and a couple of them are running in parallel tomorrow morning. So you'll be able to choose between a session on CSAM or online gaming and later a session on youngest users or harmful content. Um, and it's worth pointing out that all sessions apart from the CSAM deep dive will be recorded. In addition, we're really keen to hear from you about your ideas for concrete actions that could be included in this updated Better Internet for Kids strategy that will be published next year. Um, the previous strategy from 2012 it talked about what different stakeholders could do and should do. And just to give two examples, it said that industry, for example, should establish and deploy EU-wide in cooperation with relevant national actors, a mechanism allowing children using their services to report harmful content and conduct. Uh, it also said that member states should match the commission's support for public awareness raising at the national level. Now, I think we'd all agree uh, that these are the kind of actions which continue to be really important today, but we want to draw on your expertise and creativity to come up with new and innovative ideas which can help the European Commission to make sure that the various relevant actors in this field will continue playing their role. So these are the kinds of statements that we're looking for. And a link to this very short survey will be included in the chat and you should be able to see that uh, any minute now. We'll keep the survey open throughout the forum uh, and we'll keep reminding you uh, to contribute as many ideas as you may have. Um, and as you listen to our speakers, um, I'm sure some of those ideas will appear. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to Commissioner Thierry Breton, uh, who has kindly recorded some opening remarks. Dear participants uh, of the Safe Internet Forum 2021. A safe, secure, and trusted digital space is definitely a cornerstone of our European digital society. This is particularly true for children, 
who increasingly grow up online. Every child has a right to be as respected, protected, and empowered online as offline. For many of the 90 million children and young people in Europe, the boundary between the online and the offline world is falling. However, the pandemic showed us that not all children have adequate access to digital technologies. A digital divide persists. And this despite the fact that digital skills have become crucial for all children, for school, for social contact, and also, of course, for future employment. Girls and boys today are digital natives, but we also need them to be digitally literate. And we wish that many more of them would become uh, ICT specialists when they grow up. The digital transformation is a fundamental objective for Europe. We want Europe's digital decade plan to empower and unleash opportunities for everyone in Europe, and especially, of course, for our children. Yet, children are also vulnerable, of course. Just as no one would uh, let children go out uh, in the dark alone, we need to do everything possible to avoid exposing them to the danger hiding behind as a glittering screen of a smartphone, a video game, or a computer. We are the first continent in the world to put in place a reorganization of uh, our digital space. Europe wants the largest platform to uh, tackle illegal content and to reduce the risks they pose, and in particular for children. The first ever legal uh, framework on artificial intelligence proposed by the Commission will also protect uh, children's rights. And new audiovisual rules uh, pay specific attention to protecting children. But beside regulation, what is really important to me, and I said it many times, is education. There are so many interesting things uh, out there in the digital space, yet some of them are fake news or hateful messages which can seriously harm children in their development. We need to teach our children how to choose. It is a good time to start a new chapter in child online protection and empowerment. Artificial intelligence, immersive technology, smart toys, distance learning, distance education. The new Better Internet for Children strategy, which we plan to adopt next year, aims to respond to this development. This summer, we ask experts, European children and young people, what their digital future should look like. Around 750 kids have shared their own views. And this is, a, I should say, an amazing response. Today, in this Safer Internet Forum, we are taking stock of their feedback and also looking for inspiration on what we should do next. We call on you, young parents, parents, teachers, civil society, researchers and companies. And uh, I invite uh, you all to contribute to building together the digital world that young people deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those inspiring words and that all important reminder that in all its different forms, the digital divide does persist. Um, as the Commissioner said, it's a good time to start a new chapter in child protection um, and empowerment online. And we've got three excellent speakers to do just that for us. They're each going to share their vision uh, for 2030 and help to get us all thinking about what needs to be done, what needs to be changed in order for children and young people to live in the digital world that they deserve. Um, so our first speaker is Professor Urs Gasser, who is the incoming Professor of Public Policy, Governance and Innovative Technology at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, many of you will know him from his previous role at the Burton Klein Centre at Harvard. Uh, and some of you may have read um, one of his many books uh, co-authored in this case with John Palfrey, which is Born Digital. Um, and there have been two versions of that, you know, which again reflect the rapid changes that we do see in this space. 
that is deemed to be a central reading for anyone who wants to understand the digital present, but also shape the digital future. And so I really can't think of anyone better qualified to help us to address these issues in a meaningful way. Uh, and so without any further ado, Urs, we're really delighted that you're able to join us uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl, for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be with you all today. Um, I'm reporting from actually a 12th century monastery in the right in Haslach, uh, Bavaria. So I'm not in my office. Um, that's also why my background uh, is not uh, particularly fancy today. Uh, nonetheless, I, I'm just delighted to, to set uh, the stage a little bit with my wonderful colleagues, Veronica and Regina, and uh, to reflect a bit about some of the bigger picture issues as we are thinking about building and setting out to build a better future uh, for youth in the digital age. Um, and speaking of youth, I, I really would like to extend my congratulations and thanks uh, to the youth panel. You have done such amazing and important work. And I also appreciate uh, all the insight um, that you shared with me as I prepared for today's presentation. So what I would like to do over the next 20, um, 25 minutes is, is really to um, uh, look at the bigger picture. Uh, sometimes when we plan for the future, it may be helpful actually to reflect on the past. Where have we come from uh, at this intersection of youth, technology and policy? So I'd like to um, take a bird's eye perspective on some of the um, past decade key developments in the second part then to focus on some of what I would argue are persisting policy challenges we may need to address. Uh, and as you will see, I will not so much talk about specific policy issues. Um, there will be many deep dives throughout the day, but cross-sectional challenges. And then I would like to end with a call for enhanced youth participation. So that's the game plan. So, as I said, uh, I'll look back at some of the main ecosystem developments over the past 15 years or so. And one of my favorite pictures and collages prepared by my colleague and collaborator Sandro Cortesi is this one. Um, that I find it just amazing to have a snapshot of young people uh, at a concert and, and see from 2007 till before the pandemic hit um, how this picture has changed. And of course, the message is clear um, to all of us. Technology has dramatically evolved over the past decade, plus uh, particularly the rise of mobile phones and smartphones is, is the game changer. And of course, many statistics would tell us today in surveys that uh, mobile phones in many parts of the world have become the main access device for young people, how they interact online, how they access the internet. Now, I would argue it, it's, of course, more than just um, mobile technology as such or, or, you know, the way we access the Internet. It also means the conditions of access. In, in some ways, the ability to access uh, the Internet and, and, and the digital world through these devices um, makes it ubiquitous. We can carry and we carry these phones everywhere and can access any time uh, the digitally networked environment. We do so also across context. So we have these access tools with us, whether uh, we are hanging out with friends or whether we're going to school or to work. So I think um, access and, and using digital technology uh, is now something that really takes place across social, professional, personal, um, educational contexts. And as we already heard in the introduction, of course, that also means that the lines in some ways are blurring between these different spheres, but also actually the spheres uh, between what we mean by offline and online. Uh, back in 2005, um, when we started to work on youth and digital media issues, um, there was a still a distinction. Well, here was the real world and here was the online world. I think today um, this is much more embedded um, and much more blurry and it's questionable whether these distinctions still make sense. 
And of course, it also um, has changed the technology evolution and the adoption and use of technology has also changed uh, what it means to use the internet. Uh, back in the days, it, it was mostly the World Wide Web. That was some sort of the killer app. And today, uh, of course, um, much of the usage is, is very much dominated by the apps and at least it's on, uh, on these slides there. And, and you're very familiar uh, with um, the popular and less popular apps of, of the day. And I think together these technological and, and behavioral shifts um, have a tremendous impact uh, on both the landscape of risks that we will talk more about throughout the day, as well as the opportunities that um, children, young people, but also adults actually experience. So another mega trend reflecting on the past uh, decade, in my view, is, is really that youth spaces have become deeply commercialized. Um, and so in addition to the technological evolution, I would like to, to highlight that. Here is an example on the slide where you see a young person um, uh, buying a sneaker and, and you see that um, there are many different steps where offline and online is actually starting to uh, interact with each other uh, when it's, you know, from trend spotting online to then um, engaging with friends over Snapchat or Instagram um, to then following the brand to then actually buying or, or trying on the shoe in the shoe store uh, and at the sneaker and then ordering it online. So this is a real world example um, of, of you know how a teenager today may actually engage in in, in one single transaction, which is uh, is purchasing a, a sneaker. And you can see that most of these spaces are now deeply commercial. And of course, the risks are, are um, front and center in many of the debates today uh, around commercial surveillance, about, uh, around surveillance capitalism, um, and the impact that has on, on, on some sort of uh, autonomy and agency of young people. Um, but I, I would also say the opposite um, may be uh, worth considering as well that um, some of these spaces are also spaces to build cultural and economic capital. So we also see young people actually um, building skills in, in commercial spaces. Think about TikTok uh, or YouTube. So again, even if I'm uh, very troubled by this commercial enclosure of youth spaces, I also do think uh, we need to look at possible uh, opportunity spaces and not only focus on the risks. And of course, uh, that's not the end of the story. The technology continues to evolve. Um, I would say some of the technologies we see today um, are am amplifying some of these earlier uh, trends uh, that we've already mentioned. So um, I think we will see more and more technologies that give us additional access points, how we are um, accessing the digital network environment. And some of it is almost like paradoxical that uh, we know from focus groups, some young people um, really want to reduce the time they use the phone and reduce screen time, which then means that they use more and more voice interfaces and personal assistants uh, like Google Home and the like um, to uh, gather information or to engage online. And, and of course, these new types of devices that are in our homes, in our living rooms increasingly, um, uh, come with all sorts of, of risks uh, for children as well. Um, we see, of course, now the rollout of next generation technologies, including uh, artificial intelligence, and we'll get back to that shortly, um, and also augmented and virtual reality in, in various spaces, including also in classrooms, in, in the education space. Um, and I think we have to pay close attention um, to these developments, because if you take these things together, uh, it points towards a future where technology becomes even more embedded in everyday life and increasingly interconnected uh, in a way that is very different from the qualities uh, of, of, let's say, the early 2000s when we had conversations about uh, youth and uh, their digital lives. What also has changed and what was already mentioned by Carl is at the levels of awareness, of course, over the past um, 
10, 20 years, we've had lots of conversations about the implications of um, digital technology used by, by children. Um, and I think much for the good. So we've learned a lot overall. I feel it's fair to say we have a growing level of awareness. Uh, parents in particular pay much more attention uh, overall uh, compared to you know 15 years ago. Uh, young people themselves, teachers, policymakers like many in the audience today uh, pay very close attention. Uh, nonetheless, as um, the youth consultation and also uh, research points out important gaps remain and, and again it was pointed out in introduction as well we have age gaps we have participation gaps in along socio-economic um, uh, uh, divides um, and above all I would also say awareness doesn't equal agency so it's one thing to be aware of risks and opportunities but it's a very different thing to be able to act upon uh, these uh, insights or this baseline understanding. And I feel uh, the challenge ahead is, um, yes, to improve awareness um, and to bridge the gaps that were identified, but also uh, to move beyond awareness and uh, move towards empowerment and um, agency. Now, perhaps the hardest part and the biggest puzzle still is to understand the different uh, intersectionality or the intersectionality between the different areas that I just mentioned. Uh, I feel we have learned um, to appreciate the complexity of how technological advancements, changing business models, uh, adaptive use of behavior, um, regulatory interventions and policy um, uh, decisions all interact in complex ways with, ways with each other and actually make it quite hard um, to uh, plan policy uh, in the future. And, and there are still knowledge gaps. Uh, I think we, we learned a lot uh, how to manage uh, the interplay between these different um, uh, forces at play. Um, but it, it, I think we're still far away from, from having uh, a, a clear understanding how to uh, be most effective in this space. And this leads to the last um, observation, like in bigger picture terms uh, and in terms of what um, some of these uh, trends have been, as I see them and suggest them by way of example over the past decade. Of course, we live in a, also in an evolving policy space, policymakers around the globe, international organizations, some of here, uh, some mentioned here, uh, as well as, as individual countries, um, NGOs and the like, have responded to this evolving field, um, responded to the new types of risks that we see emerge. Um, and it's great to see uh, many new efforts, including the ones uh, uh, we're talking about today, uh, including the Digital Decade uh, Initiative, uh, to uh, learn from the past and envision the future. Now, what I'd like to contribute is against some sort of the backdrop I just sketched. What are, from my perhaps a bit more subjective perspective, a few um, recurring themes that I feel will persist also as we enter the next cycle of policy making, um, also at the um, beginning of the AI age when it comes to youth uh, and digital technology. I would like to highlight three uh, such challenges. The first one I, I already mentioned, and that is, yes, of course, we all have, as policymakers, we all aspire to be evidence-based. At the same time, uh, at least as a researcher, um, or wearing a hat, my hat as a researcher, uh, I do think we still have much more work to do to build robust interfaces between the world of research on the one hand side and policy making at various levels on, on the other hand side. My favorite example from the youth uh, space is uh, I remember quite clearly when researchers, uh, including some of my collaborators, we were ready uh, to share evidence uh, what's happening on MySpace. Now, um, many young people in the audience may not even remember MySpace. That was at one point the really big popular social 
um, a network uh, 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 like Facebook and even Facebook as we know today is no longer uh, necessarily popular among young people, it's actually for old people like myself. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is just a great example because we were ready to share data and um, evidence about MySpace at the time where MySpace wasn't even used anymore um, and, and Facebook was the dominant platform. So there's definitely a timing problem. How can we synchronize the speed of research and synchronize it with the speed of policy making? I think that's uh, a tricky question. Um, uh, also because technology is evolving so fast and also user behavior is developing uh, quite rapidly. But it's not only the challenge of timing and being faster and, and some sort of creating better interfaces um, to manage this uh, challenge. It's also how do we ensure that we are asking the right questions? And I will return to that topic at the very end of the presentation. I, I think um, the past decade has also shown that quite often um, research and certainly policy making um, is at times driven by concerns by adults um, and young people may actually see problems in, in a different place, um, may see different challenges than, than adults and I feel that's uh, very important to close this gap both in the world of um, research and policy making. So um, you will hear my plaidoyer for youth involvement and youth participation also in research. So to make sure we're asking the right question and addressing the right problem and not the problems we think, we as adults think are the real problems. There are many other issues. Uh, I just maybe want to add uh, one to the list and that is access to data. Uh, I feel, especially with last week's uh, also Facebook um, scandal uh, uh, where, you know, internal research has been leaked, it shows we have a problem that the best available data is quite often no longer available to researchers at universities or independent think tanks, but within companies. Now, don't get me wrong, actually, I think it's great that Facebook is doing research and tries to understand what the impact of their services are and how they can actually enhance and improve the safety and well-being of young people. But the problem really is if that research not only isn't shared, but if independent researchers don't have access to the data based on which this research is founded. And so if for the next policy cycle, uh, that's my main point here, we really need to think hard about these research policy making interfaces and address a whole set of uh, hard problems including the last one um, uh, access to data um, and this is also in an environment where of course it becomes increasingly challenging to find funding for the kind of youth and technology research uh, i'm talking about here just to add one more uh, um, tune to that to that theme um, we see now a flourishing of um, reports on artificial intelligence and child rights and, 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 and child uh, policy, which is fantastic. You see here just a snapshot of some of the recent work. Um, and yet, you know, I, I strongly believe in many areas we are flying in the dark. Uh, we, are, we are now thinking about policies um, and are start to craft policies for the future. Uh, but not in all areas we understand really what the technology will be doing uh, and quite naturally because it's early stage uh, in, in some ways. And so a question also becomes as new evidence becomes available, as we have new data, as research, researchers around the globe focus on, let's say, the impact of AI, AI on the well-being of young people, how can we make sure that we can update our policies going forward and keep them as a learning system? Uh, uh, one idea we've been proposing is to create a longitudinal study uh, and a, a panel of young people where we can study, for instance, the impact of AI-based technologies over time, because that's another problem um, with data and evidence right now uh, that we don't often have in the youth space consistent methodologies and an ability to track over time a particular population and better understand also how our policy 
uh, interventions, what effects they have going forward. So that's just an illustration of where I think um, some of the key questions are as we are thinking about evidence and, and uh, policy making interfaces. I will be shorter on the next two. Um, a second uh, recurring theme going forward is really this question of um, how do we bring together the different stakeholders across different spheres to both address some of the challenges, old ones and the emerging ones, and also unlock some of the opportunities. I think overall, uh, over the past decade, we have made good progress to understand that um, different stakeholders have to work hand in hand and work together to address safety issues and address privacy issues and increase literacy and the like. Um, but still, uh, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, we, we still have much more uh, work ahead to figure out who's responsible for what. And especially in moments where uh, we have, or in situations where we have power asymmetries, uh, for instance, between companies and young people, but I would say also between uh, parents or caregivers uh, and youth, we have to ask ourselves, well, how do, do we deal with uh, the working together of these different actors to ultimately also empower young people and give them uh, the agency um, well, they, they, they deserve and, uh, and have a right to. So um, this notion of coordination and working together across spheres becomes harder and harder, of course, also in a very polarized environment as we live in. The stakes are high. Um, we have, you know, many um, larger societal questions and questions of political economy that factor into the youth and technology debate as well. Um, but I would say we should not only focus on the risks, but really think hard how we can bring together different stakeholders to make progress on also what I call a positive agenda. And to me, one of the most promising areas that I would propose um, uh, for, for, you know, as, a, as an area of attention uh, is connected learning. Uh, one of the big insights from the past um, 15 years of work in the youth and digital media spaces, of course, that young people are learning in different ways and in different places um, and with different partners uh, in the digital environment compared to the old analog environment. And that's a tremendous opportunity, um, uh, especially also for uh, young people who may not have access to tra traditional institutions of education. But it, it's an opportunity that, it, that needs a lot of work. There are also lots of pitfalls and lots of uh, uh, new barriers that emerge. And so I would say, while we need to focus on risks and, and responsibilities, let's also spend as much energy uh, to figure out how companies, parents, schools, out of school at, um, institutions, young people, policymakers can all work hand in hand um, uh, to promote digital literacy, to bolster uh, future skills, 21st century skills, however you want to uh, name it, across different spheres of learning. So not only the traditional educational sphere, but also the social and personal sphere. So I see that as a positive agenda, as a, a, a particularly intriguing uh, challenge for us to work together. The last persisting challenge I would like to highlight today, uh, and I will wrap up uh, quite quickly after that, is we see now, and you've seen the slide with the AI reports, we see a new wave of policies um, dealing with technology in general. Uh, so we see it around AI in particular, and specifically also with a focus on young people. And I think that's fantastic. At the same time, uh, it also creates a new challenge, and that is someone has to implement uh, these policies into practice. And that's not easy. Um, from my personal experience working with, with people and institutions who have to apply best practices and policies and, and turn it into something actionable, there is still a, a, a really hard knowledge gap to bridge, an information symmetry to bridge. You see that between private and public sector, but you also see it between 
um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the majority world, uh, the global south and the global north. We have massive asymmetries in terms of the kind of resources you can put at uh, translating policy into practice. And um, much progress has been made. I, I just want to mention the implementation guide, for instance, by the Council of Europe. Uh, UNICEF has recently um, also uh, provided guidance on AI for children. So there's good work on the way. At the same time, in practice, um, it, it's still hard to, even with that guidance, understand what it means to put best practices in this space into practice. I give an example, uh, just very briefly. Um, we at the Berkman Klein Center, my previous academic home, we, we um, worked in a, in a clinical setting, in a policy clinic setting with the city of Helsinki. Uh, the city of Helsinki um, set out to um, support the learners in the city with an AI-based tool that would personalize uh, learning. Uh, and uh, the city of Helsinki officials recognized, well, that's that's really uh, great. On the one hand side, there's tremendous promise to support learners, but there are also risks. And um, we're also very aware um, of best practices on AI and ethics uh, principles and the like. Uh, and um, still being extremely knowledgeable city officials, um, it was very hard to operationalize, operationalize uh, some of these principles and we teamed up together with young people um, to figure out what it does it mean for instance to uh, be accountable to live up to this principle of accountability when you take a concrete app that's introduced in schools and uh, in educational environment or how does meaningful participation look like and when you work through these very specific questions um, you understand immediately, or at least we, uh, it was our experience, how hard it is actually to figure out what the right thing to do is. So even if we have principles, we have some guidance, the case by case, which is very contextual, is not trivial. And my main message is, as we policymakers uh, uh, come into the next phase of new policies and additional policies, let's not forget that we also need to build the capacity to help decision makers and implementers um, to make sense of these policies and be able to um, translate them into something actionable. So this brings me uh, quickly to, to the last part and I touched upon the core theme already. As we move into the future, I think um, we arrive at the point where uh, it's fair to say previous policy cycles at this intersection of youth um, uh, and technology have focused on protection and we need to continue to do that. And I know there are very serious concerns that will be highlighted and addressed today. I feel we also have made some progress to build upon around provision, which is, you know, access and, 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 and tools of empowerment. Yet, I think the next policy cycle needs to add and strengthen and bolster this notion of participation. We have to figure out how to make youth, um, to equip youth to really participate in uh, the shaping of this future. And I think it has two uh, different aspects. The first one is, um, how can we make sure that we create environments in which young people can participate fully and safely in society. And this includes everything from um, public discourse and civic engagement to the digital economy. I feel despite all the progress we've made in, in improving access, uh, there are still tremendous limits and barriers uh, to that sort of, of participation that the technology at least in theory, offers. And, and how do we unlock that potential? What are the literacies? What are the affordances that need to be addressed at the meta level, at the policy level, uh, and only then uh, can lead to change? And the second dimension of participation is around um, participation in the development of, of the policies we're talking about. And again, I would like to applaud the organizers of the forum um, to invite young people in these conversations and also the European Commission for that matter. 
I think it also has to go beyond the participation in policy making, but as I just pointed out, is the example of Helsinki also when it comes to implementation. Now, that sounds easy, and uh, again, we've made some progress in listening carefully to youth. I think we need more. Um, we have youth participation requires actually a serious investment and the long-term investment. We need to understand what youth want um, when they engage with us. Uh, we launched a youth consultation again back at the Third Compliance Center in collaboration with ITU to ask this question, what young people would like from us in return for, for their participation in these policy exercises and conversations. And four things um, stand out, and I, I run briefly through it as I'm running out of time. First, young people want to acquire domain specific as well as transferable skills. That was one key insight from the survey among about 1,000 uh, youth, uh, lots of them also in the global south. Second, they seek long-term engagement that is relevant to their long-term goals. Three, youth has a unique perspective and they expect to be equal partners in the exercises. And I think, again, that's a hard challenge because they become better at listening to you, but are they also part of the decision-making? Do they have voting rights or not? And maybe lastly, the course and, uh, and program design should also be sensitive to these contexts. And again, if you go into practice and look at um, these uh, insights from the survey, which was conducted by um, Sandra Patrice and Alex, Alex Ahasi, uh, you see it's, it's actually not trivial uh, to, to pull it off at a systematic level. And what we've done uh, to not only um, have some sort of the call for participation. We've mapped different models of youth participation. You find it in the report that I shared before. Uh, I mentioned already the importance of participatory research, having young people involved in the entire research process when we talk about risks and opportunities. Um, there's a format called Youth Labs, a space to create knowledge exchange that can be used by NGOs, international organizations, but also companies. Uh, Co-design is another mode of, of youth participation and finally uh, youth boards. Uh, all these models are described in the report. We have some personal experience with them. We've learned from many of you running similar initiatives. And our hope is that such a repository of good practices can also inform and make more concrete um, policies that emphasize the importance of participation in addition to provision and protection. So uh, I hope that this gives enough reason uh, 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 or appetite maybe um, to really um, team up and uh, challenge ourselves what can we do at the policy level as well as the implementation level um, to bolster um, youth participation and take youth participation seriously, which is not a trivial thing. Uh, the last slide is uh, this also applies to the to the education space um, and that's just maybe one example where such youth participation can turn into practice uh, we are talking about the importance of more literacy of digital citizenship skills yet how often are we able to include youth in the creation uh, of, of learning materials at Berkman Klein again just as a placeholder um, we have put out learning materials co-produced with youth um, that are now used around the world. And I'm featuring this not to promote the Berkman Klein Center, which I love, uh, but as an example of the kinds of uh, underground practices uh, that will make uh, our policies successful uh, in the future. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Urs, thank you so much for that. Um, you've given us a huge amount to think about, um, real insight into some of those key developments. And I think the policy changes, the questions that we need to ask, and I hope some of this will become clearer as we move through um, the next couple of days. Um, time is tight as always, but we've had a couple of questions um, which are actually from um, two of our young people. Um, and if I may, I'll, I'll just ask you those. The, the first one comes from Prachi, um, who's um, one of the youth panelists from Ireland. 
and she says, in 10 years time, we will no longer be youths. Um, and will the policies that we make now as youths be updated regularly by younger generations or actually by us? Well, if we get it right, we will have figured out how to involve young people uh, when you're no longer a young person, Prachi, uh, in these processes. I think we haven't figured this out, but we have the time with your leadership and your help to figure it out now so that these processes, mechanisms, rights, infrastructures are in place when you are uh, as old as I am right now. Thanks, Urs. So clearly now is the time to make the change and we need to start thinking about it. And and, and the second one um, is from Dimitris, um, who is one of our youth panelists from Cyprus. And he says, if policies are about having rules for the internet, then will those policies include rules about offline life as well? For example, you know, introducing required online safety and education in school, indicating the teaching materials that should be used. Um, so yeah, the offline and the online. Dimitris, thank you for this excellent question. I think you're absolutely right, although you framed it as a question. We have to think online and offline together as we um, discussed, and I'm sure we'll hear much more. The lines are blurring. Um, it is add, adds a challenge to policy making. It adds complexity, but I, I strongly feel we have to look across different spheres of a young person's life. We have to uh, understand that the technologies we're talking about are deeply embedded, uh, have online and offline components, have digital and non-digital components, and only then uh, we will be able to address the risks, but also unlock um, the promise uh, of, of these new uh, capabilities. Thank you again. Thanks, Urs. I have one final question, if we may, just, just really quickly. Um, th this is a question that's come in from Professor Sonia Livingston um, from the LSE, who many of you will know. Um, and she says, you know, if we could get any data that we wanted from social media platforms, what sort of new knowledge would we expect about online risk and platforms' roles in both risk and safety? I appreciate the question, and of course, uh, it's uh, it would be much more interested, um, interesting to hear Sonia answering her own question because she's the foremost expert in, in this field. Um, my feeling is that uh, uh, we even lack some baseline data over time. Uh, we don't have the granularity of data that big companies have. So I think it would actually transform our entire research agenda and the kinds of questions we are able to ask. Um, uh, I think uh, EU Kids Online, uh, which um, Sonia has led, gives tremendous insight, but we also know um, uh, the limits of what we can do from looking at the outside on what's happening on platforms. So I think it would be transformative. And maybe the main question, what the main response to the question is, we wouldn't even know what questions we're going to ask once we have the data that we don't have right now. Yeah, absolutely. Th thank you so much, Urs, and, and I hope that we'll be able to continue some of these conversations um, later on today and tomorrow. So, so look, um, colleagues, without further ado, um, I'm going to pass to our second speaker now, um, who is Professor Veronica Barassi from the University of St. Gallen. Um, her work focuses on the impact of data technologies and artificial intelligence on human rights and democracy. Um, and some of you uh, who are watching today may be among the two million viewers um, who've actually seen her TED talk, What Tech Companies Know About Your Kids, which was recorded in late 2019. And Veronica urges parents, you know, to take a more active role, but also demands protections that ensure that children's data doesn't skew their future. And um, so, Veronica, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts around what the future holds. Thank you so much for making the time to do this and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm honored to be here. Um, I'll uh, try to be uh, uh, brief and um, uh, so that we have some time for questions. Um, I Just a second, I'm going to share uh, my screen with you. Okay, so uh, 
Um, so, um, I don't know why it went down again, okay, sorry. Can you see it now? I assume so. Um, so, um, I want to talk to you today about uh, uh, my own research work that I've been carrying uh, since 2015, 2016. Um, and uh, uh, it was basically a study on how much data we're producing of children, um, what is the political economy of this data, and how are parents uh, uh, reacting to the datification of uh, family life. And I want to start. Uh, uh, with uh, a personal uh, story. Uh, so, um, during the lockdown in December, I um, found myself uh, emptying my parents' um, house and my room of 40 years. And when I walked into my room, I actually uh, was overwhelmed by the abundance of uh, data traces that I could find. And um, so, just to give you an idea, next to my bed, I found uh, all these little messages that we used to send uh, um, to each other uh, in high school under the desk. Um, and, uh, and what messages? They told the stories of crushes, they told the stories of fights, uh, but also they were messages that were the proof of all of my stupidity at the time. Uh, and then I found old medical bills and, and medical diagnosis that I had forgotten about. I found uh, also one report card um, of my secondary school where uh, my teacher wrote clearly that I was very distracted and that I lacked uh, academic skills. And so as I kind of uh, uh, started uh, going through my own data traces, I, I asked myself what would have happened uh, to me if all those data traces were processed by modern day algorithms for, I don't know, for personalized education programs, uh, so would have would have I had uh, access to only specific type of content or other, uh, or if the messages in that tin box uh, were actually available to my employers in uh, a job interview, or moreover, the, more, more um, accurately, if they, if they were available to an AI that then made a decision that sold to my employer in a job interview. And you see, I started questioning, I asked myself these questions because uh, in uh, December that year, uh, just uh, two weeks before I entered my own uh, uh, bedroom, I had uh, published a book uh, which is called The Child Data Citizen, How Tech Companies Are Profiling Us From Before Birth. And it was uh, published by MIT Press last December. The book was based on a very um, if you want a very personal research project that I had launched for, uh, in 2016, um, that was called Child Data Citizen. Um, what happened to me, it was that in 2016 I was living in London and, um, and I was writing about social media and political participation and obviously the question about data. Um, and as I was writing about that, uh, I um, I got pregnant, and I was through my I went through my first uh, um, uh, year of uh, uh, pregnancy leave, and uh, and as I was talking to parents, I realized that whilst we had some discussion, especially in relation to uh, debates around social media and social media surveillance and data accumulation and uh, and, uh, and other aspects of uh, um, the so-called rise of uh, surveillance capitalism in relation to social media, what we didn't have, it was a critical understanding of what was happening to family life. And that year, uh, my husband, at, at, that, at that time I was living in London, and, uh, and so I started my own research on my daughter, but also working with parents in London. But that year, my husband was also moved to uh, the US uh, and relocated to the US in Los Angeles uh, for work. Um, and I um, and we decided and we started living this crazy life between half between Los Angeles, half between London. And I had my second daughter in, in Los Angeles. And so I started this, uh, the Child Data Citizen project really ran between the two, uh, 2016 and 2019. And it was really uh, aimed at investigating the identification of uh, children uh, from a parent's perspective. Uh, and uh, what I did is I worked with families in both cities. 
that had children between the zero, uh, zero and 13 years of age, uh, whose personal information online is ruled obviously by COPPA. Um, I carried out uh, 50 semi-structured interviews and eight months of digital ethnography uh, of the eight families' uh, sharing practices. Um, but I also carried out a very um, deeply autobiographic project in which I would uh, uh, write down all those instances in my life in which, as a parent, I didn't have a choice. And, uh, and, in, and, and all the questions that emerged as my own children were being datafied in both the UK and the US in kind of similar but different ways, right? But that was not enough for me. I also wanted to understand a little bit more about what was happening, actually happening to the data of children. And that was a very uh, tricky question. Um, so I decided to, uh, to do a platform analysis of uh, four social media platforms, uh, 10 uh, health tracking apps, baby apps and pregnancy app, home apps, and four educational platforms. And basically the platform analysis consisted in the analysis of the promotional com uh, cultures of these companies, their business models, and the data policies, and also um, their different patent requests. So how were they uh, how were they promoting themselves uh, uh, and targeting children? And also, how what were they what were they saying about how they collected children data? Right. And uh, the key findings from my project uh, are pretty much uh, uh, summarized in uh, uh, in a few areas. The first uh, um, uh, understanding it was really that there is an inevitability. Um, of the typification of family life. Uh, increasingly more families talked about how they uh, in, felt pressured and, uh, and how it all changed quite uh, um, significantly over the last uh, five to six years in the, in the amount of data that was being asked from them. Um, and they were kind of aware, starting to be really aware of this statification of their children and negotiating with this statification of children. Also, what I realized was uh, um, uh, because during my interview samples, I really made an effort to capture the pluriverse of, uh, of the experience that, that we live uh, in uh, cities like London and, uh, and, um, and Los Angeles. So I tried to interview parents from very, very different backgrounds, different ethnic, uh, ethnic backgrounds, but also uh, different income. Um, and um, and what came out, it was that there was a real um, issue of inequality when we talked about datification. You had families, uh, and, uh, and in my book, I talk about the example of uh, uh, two fathers, so one from the UK and one from the US, who pushed forward the idea that they knew what was happening to data and that they were fine with it because they understood the process uh, uh, and they understood and they saw it coming. Um, whilst, uh, and I compare this to uh, with uh, um, other uh, two uh, women in, uh, uh, who were immigrants and, uh, and were in very vulnerable position in society, uh, who really felt uh, violated by the deification of everyday life. And for them, everything happened all of a sudden. So there was that, so one of the key aspects of my research is to show how deeply unequal is the deification of family life. And obviously, as I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll argue later, also the impact of that education. Um, there was another aspect that emerged quite clearly from my research and that I um, wrote in a paper in 2009, which is uh, um, the, the complexity of the data environments that we live in are often uh, leading to a systematic coercion of our digital participation, where families do not have a choice anymore. And I make many different examples and the pandemic has exasperated this. And to give you an idea, after five years of uh, uh, working on the identification of children, uh, during the pandemic I had to create a Google, uh, a Google um, Classroom account for my daughter. Even if I tried to convince the school to use another platform, it didn't work. And in that sense, I really didn't have a choice. It was not that I was not informed. I knew what was going on, what was happening. And I tried to, to have agency, but I, I didn't have it. So this is the second aspect that emerged from a study of actually what's happening in the identification of family. And the third part of, uh, of my project actually highlighted how children 
are the very first generations of citizens that are datafied from before birth. And I connect this idea of a citizen because really what's happening with the creation of AI technologies is that increasingly more the data traces that we are collecting about them today will define them in public in the future if we don't uh, act now, right? Um, and that's, for me, it's something very important that we have to recognize uh, that uh, we're not only talking about consumer data, but we're also talking about data that is uh, connected to uh, different human rights uh, and their rights as, cit uh, as citizens. Now, one other aspect that really emerges uh, well in my work, uh, uh, and I think that this is the main challenge that we are faced uh, with today when we're talking about uh, data, children, and the uh, AI developments that occurred over the last uh, uh, decade. Um, and, the, the, and, and this is a, the very fundamental question of my work is this idea of profiling. You know, over the last decade, we bought into the idea that uh, it is all data is fair game, that, that it's fine to have computers and predictive analytics and to have uh, different AI uh, technologies that um, collect all the different types of data from different areas, family life, from health, from education, from social media, and bring all this data to construct the different types of profiles of, uh, of, uh, of people. Uh, and use this profile for this data-driven decision-making. I'm very much interested in this transformation, this techno-historical transformation. And when we talk about the profiling of children, I think that we need to be aware that there are at least this is happening at three different levels. On one hand, uh, we have obviously the world of uh, data brokers uh, who are selling and, and creating uh, profiles of children on the basis of uh, the data that they collect and then they sell that data to others. So an example that I often use uh, in my research is a study on educational data brokers by Russell et al. in 2019, which show how educational data brokers um, collect the name of children as young as two uh, and, uh, and, and, and put that together with a series of other data um, and so sell their profiles to uh, whoever wants to buy them. Right, basically, uh, and they sell these profiles in very. These profiles are very, uh, if you want, they are so reductionist because uh, uh, children are being profiled on the basis of their ethnicity, on the basis of their religion, on the basis of whether they're awkward or not. Right, so we have all this world behind the behind us uh, that is actually profiling children, and the regulation there, the laws there in place are still not really covering the uh, the span of uh, what's happening um what's happening uh, the other issue that is emerging over the last when we're talking about the profile of children um, is the development of ai technologies which are incre increasingly used to profile children in different contexts the uh, schools uh, uh, are a fundamental example because if you think about schools we're not only seeing the rise of uh, uh, personalized learning, um, but also the, the rise of facial recognition technologies uh, to identify students uh, who could be potentially risk at risk or that could be perpetrators of mass shootings like in the US, right? So we have all this kind of uh, new technologies of profiling that are surrounding children. Um, and then this, and this is uh, the main uh, point of uh, uh, the Child Data Citizen book, um, which is uh, another way in which we can think about how children are being profiled, is to acknowledge that uh, at the moment, the big tech have access to different types of data. They have access to health data through web searches uh, and by buying off the data of, uh, of uh, health apps. Um, but also through investment in the health sector. So they have access to health data, they have access to uh, educational data, uh, again, by through, through web searches or, or through um, apps, uh, educational apps, uh, but also through investment within the education sector. Um, they had access to what I defined as home life data in 2019, uh, 18, sorry, uh, which is basically data that is collected from their homes. So, uh, for instance, uh, um, from virtual assistants, from Google uh, Home, uh, Google Assistant, um, uh, or Alexa, and other type of uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence technologies uh, that are hearing and recording a lot of uh, family life. And then uh, they have access, of course, to everything that we produce uh, publicly and everything that children produce publicly, like on social media, right? So, and what my uh, research has brought me to the understanding is that if you look at the role of the big tech, that they have the means to aggregate all these different forms of data under unique ID profiles. Uh, and these unique ID profiles can actually uh, push, uh, well, could actually um, follow children across a lifetime. Now, one aspect, and I'm going to be brief and I'm going to finish now. Um, so, one aspect that really um, fascinates me about uh, the profiling of children um, is the fact that most of these children uh, or, and most of this process of profiling is reliant on uh, data traces that are messy, that are complex, and they are disconnected from, from intentions and behaviors. Um, and this is something very uh, serious. Most of the data that we produce is not accurate data. We're, the data is not the mirror of who we are and our behavior. So actually the fact that children and people are being profiled on the basis of this data is, uh, uh, could lead to all sorts of uh, bias and error and, uh, and implications. And I made uh, clear this in 2018 in, uh, in uh, the uh, report that I wrote for, um, uh, that I submitted to the ICO uh, call for consultations on the age appropriate uh, design code. And that was signed uh, by uh, the uh, director of Privacy International and supported by the director of the Center for Digital Democracy in, in Washington. So this idea that if you look at the data that we are collecting from our home, this data is not only personal data, it's highly contextual data that is connected to the family, um, but also this data is uh, very unpredictable and, uh, and messy and, uh, and complex. Um, and uh, and uh, at the moment, and one, one of the things that really scares me is that at the moment, despite uh, um, we have started to uh, highlight uh, the issue of home life data in 2018. Uh, uh, um, at the moment, we're seeing the proliferation of many different new databases that, that include the data of, uh, of children. So examples uh, that I make in my latest book that I just wrote, and it's going to be published in November, but actually it's a book in Italian, and I'm looking into the translation of it. Um, but examples like uh, Clearview AI, which is being collecting the face uh, of, uh, of people from all over the world from social media. And that is uh, a, a, a database that is, a lot, uh, is used by the police uh, to identify criminals, uh, but also to identify uh, victims of abuse, are, um, are all very, um, uh, if you want, uh, uh, important steps um, that kind of show us uh, uh, what type of AI driven futures we are actually facing. And in, uh, in, the, um, in the last book that I wrote, one example that I bring forward to, to give you an idea of how this data is being used and how the children, data of children is, is impacted in this, um, I use the example of a database which is called Clear um, and, um, and that it's, uh, it's, it's a database that is owned by Tom, Thomson Reuters in the US. And Clear basically is a database that has been collected with the data that has been uh, gathered by different 80 different companies that offer home services, which could be electricity, telephone, uh, internet, smart TV, and so on. And all these uh, companies have uh, so obviously sold their data uh, to Thomson Reuters. And now this data, this uh, gigantic database that actually has 400 million American citizens in it, um, is actually used for federal investigations. So it's, it's used for um, fraud detection, uh, health fraud, immigration fraud, but also for child protection by child protection services. And a lot of the data that is in this database uh, is, uh, is uh, because of the child protection uh, services is children's data. So uh, to conclude, I, I think that uh, we are uh, living at a historical time that uh, is uh, a very particular time where we are seeing uh, um, a, a, a radical transformation in the way in which uh, society is using the data of children. Um, and, this, and this has been obviously uh, highlighted by the pandemic 
but that transformation was already there and it's just been amplified by the pandemic. Um, and I believe that we do not have as yet uh, uh, the regulations in place to protect our children from that. So, for instance, our regulations focus a lot on consent, but most of the consent of, uh, of families is uh, coerced, as I've shown. They don't have, really have a choice. And the second thing is that uh, um, most of the um, our regulations are because they are based on individual choice and individual freedom and individual consent. Um, they they kind of uh, um, don't really address what's happening behind the scenes. And so, what how people are actually using the data, not because we provide it, but because they observe it from others and others and others and others and all that data broken that happens behind the scenes. I think that we should. There are some solutions that we can take. So, for instance. Um, I have been uh, campaigning for the last years to um, try to convince people to, well, to, to, to include in regulation the fact that if a company uh, gathers data of children uh, from an individual profile, and that's the real problem from, a, from a, an adult profile, um, it, the company should delete that data. It should not be able to process it because this is the real issue that we are facing, that at the moment our children are encountering technologies that are often not designed for uh, and uh, or developed for them, and therefore they do not have to abide to the data regulations that we have in place to protect them. Uh, but nonetheless, they collect so much data about them. So I think that that's the real issue that we should tackle quite soon as we step into uh, more AI-driven uh, futures. Uh, thank you. Veronica, thank you so much. Um, you've given us such a lot to think about there. I think what comes through very clearly for me is that very often um, individuals don't have a choice, young people don't have a choice. And I think we're very fortunate that we do have somebody like yourself who's actually looking into these things and trying to raise our awareness of it. Um, there have been a number of questions that have come in. What I'm going to do is actually um, introduce um, the final speaker now and bring you both back at the end and quickly try and address as many of these questions as we can just in terms of time. I'm very sorry but I have to leave at 11.30 on the dot. So. Absolutely and, and I'm, I'm very aware of that. Yeah we, we oh, will do our best. To, yeah thanks so much Veronica. So, so colleagues without further ado um, I'll bring in um, our final speaker who I think will be well known to many of you. Um, Regina Jens Dottier is head of the Children's Rights Division um, and Council of Europe coordinator for the rights of the child. Um, she's just worked tirelessly to strengthen children's rights in the digital environment um, and I think she absolutely recognises the importance of listening to their voices when shaping policy and practice. Um, so Regina, I know that time is tight. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time to be with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, I suppose uh, the sound and video is working well. Uh, good uh, morning to everyone. It's always a challenge to speak after uh, uh, world-known researchers because they have so much to say and uh, have give us uh, so many uh, questions to think about. Uh, but uh, it allows me to really dive uh, immediately into some of the key messages that I wanted to, to draw attention to. Um, and I will be very uh, focused and to the point. Uh, so, I think uh, from the Council of Europe perspective, listening to children is really uh, the most important thing that we can do when we are uh, discussing uh, the rights of the child. And this is what we have tried and which we are consistently trying to also inspire uh, at our um, member state, uh, with our member states. Um, so the consultation and the participation of children needs to happen um, at various different stages. and. Um, when we are talking about children and the internet, we need to be able to try to somehow balance uh, balance the rights uh, with um, the risks and balance the opportunities with the risks. And we need to be able to empower and to strengthen and to protect at the same time. And this is a very complex environment, as Urs and Veronica have already uh, today uh, explained to us and given us all of those uh, many different challenges to think about. Um, but what I believe we need to do is, um, and this is also building on what the children uh, that have taken part in the consultation now, we need to build on the standards that we have. We need to make sure that the standards uh, that have been developed over the past uh, years that they are relevant, that they make sense and that uh, our states are actually making sure that uh, they are reaching uh, 
this balance uh, through uh, legal frameworks which exist, be it at the level of uh, the UN, through, for example, the UN, uh, recent UN general comment, uh, through the Council of Europe uh, with the 2018 guidelines to respect, protect and fulfill the rights of the child and the digital environment, or through uh, the different strategies of the European Commission, of the Council of Europe, which are both focusing on upholding the rights of the child in the digital environment, and of course the European Commission directives. So all of these legal instruments, they need to be harnessed, they need to be put into practice. That's my first uh, recommendation. So in 2030, can we make sure that the states have actually navigated through the next years by looking at uh, what already exists and what they are actually bound by at international level? So our guidelines, they are looking at uh, different uh, or addressing some of the gaps uh, in uh, legislation at national level, provision of rights, uh, such as access to digital tools and online content for education, leisure and socializing. It's looking at the protection rights, including the protection against harmful content and activities, online child sexual exploitation and abuse, but also data and privacy issues. I think it is crucial to have a uh, specialists such as uh, the ones that have spoken before me who are a step ahead and are trying to understand what's coming up because that is going to allow us uh, from an international perspective to be able to respond to some of the risks. So I think that uh, for me uh, what has uh, revealed over the past two years is that children have been thrust into the digital environment, nobody asked them, nobody listened to them, but the states acted, they tried their best to try to make sure that children had access to education, at least those that uh, have access, uh, because we also refer to the digital divide. Um, it is a reality. There are children that are living in poverty that have absolutely, or children of national minorities or children with disabilities that have no access to uh, the internet and to the digital technologies. But we also realized that there is a need to make sure that the platforms that are being used by the education sector, that they are actually respecting children's data and privacy. So in at the end of 2020, we um, developed guidance with the Data Protection Committee, which sort of gives an indication to our states what they need to make sure um, is uh, actually how children's data through the educational platforms are actually being done. So I have uh, very little time, but I would really like to convey a few messages because I really was thinking about what I was asked to do to look at um, our vision until 2030. So. In 2030, I would really like to uh, see that children have been listened to, not by the Council of Europe or not only by the Council of Europe or the European uh, Commission, but by member states, by industry, by um, the educational sector, by parents. I think this is really where we want to um, where we want to stand in 2030. Uh, opportunities are there, methodologies, child safeguarding, there's so much that has been done over the past years which really gives us no excuse not to listen uh, to children. Um, children in the current uh, uh, forum, uh, they have told us that uh, they are concerned about cyberbullying, hateful and harmful content, fake news and disinformation, as well as threats to privacy and data protection. So children, they want more awareness. They want themselves, parents, teachers and younger children to be on board uh, for this digital journey. And all must act together to guarantee more inclusiveness, uh, bridge the gender gap, ensure access to children in vulnerable situations. So we've already looked at it in the Council of Europe perspective. Uh, we have worked with children with disabilities to understand exactly what they want. Uh, and the report was commissioned and published on especially the situation with children with disabilities. So please let's remember also to be inclusive when we talk about child participation and when we ask children to be involved because the children that we worked with um, who uh, live with disabilities, they uh, responded to us that online safety is a shared responsibility and the industry needs to be held accountable. And I think this is a very important point which we are not really looking at. Uh, closely enough and the state is not able to um, somehow um, uh, 
address some of the risks that uh, pr the private sector is um, at times creating, not always intentionally, but uh, there are uh, perverse consequences which can uh, occur. So let's try to pay attention to that. My second point, um, and I will not be able to address all of them, but my second point is, can we please better train teachers and other professionals? So teachers, they really hold the magic wand of children's education and will be accountable or held accountable if something goes wrong. So according to the topics that children raised, I mean, we say, um, in the report, teachers want more media literacy and they want these topics to be properly addressed. But what are we talking about when we say these topics? What do you really mean? Are we talking about controversial issues? Are we talking about harmful content? And I think we should just start saying it out, saying it clearly. Can we start really to talk about and to say what we want to say. Children have access to hateful material. They have access to pornography. They have developed addiction to some of this material. And we are not educating children on what they want to be educated on. So in my view, sex and relationship education and other educational content should not be provided to children via the internet. Then we which they will consult if they do not get the right um, answers from the adults. So I would really like in 2030 that we will have proper educational curricula which really address some of these concerns because they are crucial for children's uh, really safety, for their empowerment and for their well-being. So we need a strategy. I think uh, we need a strategy and I think that in 2030 the strategies that will have been developed by the Council of Europe, yeah, the European Commission, can we really focus on making sure that they are implemented. Um, my fourth point, I think we need to build on a solid human rights legal framework and guidance and we need to make sure that all of the standards, as I said at the beginning, that they have been put into practice. We have the Lanzarote Convention, which is protecting children from sexual exploitation and abuse. 48 states have ratified this convention and are uh, working together to make sure that the standards are put into practice. So can we try to push that agenda by framing it in within the uh, the legal frameworks that we have. Child impact assessments, I think that is also something which we absolutely need to develop further. This is not easy, but it needs to happen because it is really one of the major safeguards that can help us uh, policymakers at national level and at European level to really make sure that the impact of new technology will not have an unwanted effect. So. My last point, uh, again, I have uh, run out of time. I'm trying to be uh, to, to be to the point. I think that um, children should not, uh, in this digital decade, be the objects of legislation and policies relating to this environment. They have to be involved. They have to be active players in an age appropriate manner. They must be heard. They must be listened to. Um, and what they say must have an impact. It has to. Um, make sense to them, it has to make sense to policymakers. So we need true leaders uh, at state level who believe in children because child participation, it is really not a uh, child's uh, child's play. It is really very serious as we have seen with child human rights defenders across the globe that are stepping up, that are speaking up for human rights and we need to listen to them. Um, I believe Einstein said, don't listen to people that have the answers, listen to people who have the questions. So let's start uh, listening to uh, the, uh, the, the children that are able to uh, ask the right questions and that are able to tell us what we need to hear. Thank you. Regina, thank you so much, not only for your wise words and I think for taking us to 2030 and getting us to think about what needs to be happening, but also for, for being so focused and concise as well. We really appreciate that. Um, if, if I can, we're just going to take a couple of minutes. We've had a few questions that have come in um, and one I think relates very you know, particularly to something you've said. Um, the questioner says, you know, how can we assure that the rights of children, so, you know, for example, the right to privacy are actually being put into practice? Because, you know, we've been talking about this for quite a number of years, but it hasn't happened. So, so how do we actually make sure that it does moving forwards? 
Are you addressing the question to me? I think, uh, yeah. Um, I think that uh, for us, it is it is uh, extremely important to um, uh, collaborate with both uh, researchers. It is important for us to commission research before we take any measures to design policy. And this is really what we have done when we developed the guidelines on uh, uh, for children in the digital environment together with uh, with uh, with uh, Sonia Livingston, together with uh, Eva Livens and, and others. I mean, I think it is crucial to link that gap uh, so that there is not a divide between um, the the results uh, of uh, research which is being done it needs to link into the policy and um, at the same time we need also to be able to work with the private sector and i think this is a real uh, challenge uh, because um uh, in uh, free countries uh, private enterprise is uh, allowed to and and can uh, uh, develop technology and and apps uh, and they are starting to to target and to to market uh, and to understand the behavior of children so we have to be sure that uh, somehow this is this is linked in uh, with the human rights framework and that is of course uh, the responsibility of the state to make sure that um, the frameworks are being respected also by the private sector but there are so many initiatives there are so many uh, new initiatives which are coming up so I think it is extremely difficult to uh, to observe and to follow and to understand what is really going on and what will be the impact which is why I think that as I said which is why I think that to, uh, impact the Assessments are extremely interesting. Veronica, she uh, um, discussed it in her presentation. She said exactly, um, you know, she looked back at and she tried to understand the impact that the digital um, environment is having on the data processing and collection of data of her, her child. And I think this is an example um, that you know, this is what we need to watch out for. I mean, um, observatories, uh, international or global observatories of this kind of a development uh, i don't know if it is uh, feasible and possible but you know private industry they need to have a responsibility and an accountability as well yeah absolutely and i think you make a very valid point about the fact that there's so many different initiatives in this space it's difficult for us as you know people who work there to sort of keep up with it so i think for, for regular yeah. folks it's it's really challenging yeah. Look, we're going to try and pick up a lot of these questions um, in the deep dives, um, and I think there's there's just one that I will sort of finish with, Regina, if that's okay. Um, uh, sort of one of the attendees says, look, if it's true that parents and teachers are more aware of dangers and that we're doing the awareness raising now, we should probably move on to empowerment. But what do we do about those children and young people who just don't have those new parents? Um, you know, and we know that that's a significant group, you know, obviously we don't leave them behind. So how do we sort of make sure that they're getting the information that they need? Well, I think that uh, there are many different ways of addressing that. I mean, I think that uh, the first uh, point here is just parenting, parenting, supporting parents uh, uh, in general. Uh, I think that is important. Uh, work and uh, private life balance is also important because children that are, um, are uh, I think it is important for, for, for children to have social interactions and, and real interaction with their parents. I think that is really the, the, the best uh, gift uh, one can give to, to, uh, to children. And um, I also believe that um, children uh, who are not accompanied by their parents in the digital in their digital lives um, well I think we need to uh, strengthen the education sector of course to to accompany children uh, in schools if they are going to school but otherwise we need to develop uh, we need to develop uh, educational materials that is child friendly age appropriate uh, for children themselves because they can access that uh, themselves uh, online and so I think that I, I, I really think that um, it is the responsibility of us all and also again coming back to the industry it is also the responsibility of the industry to make sure that children that are using their technology that they are and they feel uh, um, protected uh, that they are uh, are not exposed to unnecessary risks um, and that should be uh, really one of our our key priorities for the years ahead. 
Yeah, thank thank you so much, Regina. Yeah, we clearly all have a role to play, and I think that's why we have so many people here today. So, so look, colleagues, um, it brings us to the end of the opening session. Um, and you know, we've just had a comment in in the chat there from one of the youth panelists who says, as a child and a bit youth panelist, I completely agree with everything that Regina is saying, and I think that that echoes the thoughts of all of us. Um, colleagues, I, I hope you'll agree with me that it's been a really stimulating um, opening session. There's certainly a great deal to think about. Um, our three speakers, I think, have given us um, some real challenges um, about what we can expect in the future, but also what we need to do you know, to bring about change. Um, we will take some of these questions into the deep dives later, but our next session uh, is going to explore this even further and we'll hear more from members of the youth panel, but also from experts in two panel discussions, one focusing on protection uh, and the other quite rightly focusing on empowerment. Um, so I hope you can join me in thanking all of our speakers from this session and I'll leave you with a really simple message from one of our young people last night who said today we start changing things for the better uh, and I think we started to do that this morning so thanks everybody and we'll see you in around 10 minutes time so just enough time to get a, a cup of coffee and some refreshments thanks Regina and to all the other speakers
Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the next session of the Safer Internet Forum 2021. I hope you all got time for a short break. It was certainly already a very productive morning. Now this session will showcase the results of the European Commission consultations, which has gathered um, a view of various different stakeholders about their hopes for the Internet 2030. So we will dive deeper into the findings of the Digital Decade for Use consultation. This session will feature different stakeholders from the policy field, the industry sector, colleagues from the Safer Internet Centers, colleagues from academia and the educational sector, and of course, first and foremost, our big youth panelists. During the session, you will also hear from two panels uh, of some of these stakeholders who already actually took part in this consultations, our young people and the educators. Both groups will consider some of the issues raised during our opening keynote session this morning and the findings that uh, you can read further on in the report that has been shared through the chat by my colleagues already. Those two panels will specifically focus on the issues of protection and empowerment. We have a great agenda ahead of us. We encourage everyone to share your questions and comments with us in the chat to make the session as inclusive and as productive as possible. It is now my great pleasure to be joined by two of our big youth panelists. We have Frida, she's 18, she's from Finland, and Francisco, who is 17 and from Portugal with us. Hi guys, so good to see you. Welcome, it is a great pleasure to have you with us. For those of you who have been following the pre-event yesterday, um, you got an exclusive insight already um, of the work that our Big Youth panelists have done for the past month. Um, the Big Youth panel has also uh, already looked into some of the key findings. Some of our young people also took part in these national consultations that took place over the summer. So it is a very great pleasure to have both of you here. Both of you are representing actually the voice of 38 young people from over nine, uh, 19 European countries. Um, so we have a very strong youth force. And you all have picked specific issues and topics that of course are very important to us. And we will dive into these topics right now. Let me first go to Frida. Frida, your group worked on the topic of online school environment, which with no doubt is a very important topic and became especially relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tell us a little bit more why your group chose to focus on this specific topic. Well, so firstly, hello to everyone. Um, yes, uh, the topic is actually very, it's, um, uh, on the top of the time you know it's we are still on it and uh, uh it's 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 been a really difficult time for everyone for students and for teachers but it has been a great time for everyone to learn something so we wanted to bring this uh, topic kind of like up and bring some kind of in information and uh our point of view view in this because like we need it to be like discussed about Thank you so much, Frida. And we heard this also in our opening um, a message from the commissioner that with, with no doubt education is key. Your group prepared a video and um, I say let's have a look at the video to show the audience the great work you have been doing. <laughs> everyone, in this video we're going to show you why it's so important to create a better online school environment. Education is one of the most important things in everyone's life. We believe creating a better and safer online environment will be beneficial for every single person in Europe. A way of doing so is by giving us the right to access diverse quality content according to age and without having to worry about fake or harmful information. Furthermore, children should have the right to create an online identity without being victims of personal data theft and having their privacy invaded. Teaching digital literacy to every student mm -hmm. and teacher is another crucial part of having a better online school environment. This will give us a basic knowledge of the online tools that can help us in the learning process. 
Even though online teachers are usually required a bachelor's degree, not all teachers seem to be experts in technology, and that causes many problems, which can result in uncomfortable educational environment and poor understanding of subjects. That's why it's important to develop effective communication with students, especially children. There's also an issue in online school that some students have not been able to take part in online schooling for not being able to afford all the needed stuff. While teachers are trying to manage the ways of teaching students in such distance, students are trying to keep up and not fall behind. Students not having all the required stuff makes them drop out of school and it also can be seen in the growing amounts of mental health problems. Teachers should learn to use fact checkers mm. online and learn basic keyboard tricks so that they wouldn't be tricked by students. They should also learn the difference between fake error messages, cor corrupted on purpose act, and actual error messages. Educating and improving the online platform is the only way we can protect children from the dangers of the internet, which is why a change must take place. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frida, and uh, your whole group, congratulations on this very great video. Uh, you made a very clear statement, change must take place. Uh, let me ask you one more question, Frida, before we move to Francisco. If you could wish for one or two points, you hope that our audience will take away today after seeing your videos, which two key messages would you like them to uh, be reminded of? Uh, well, change must take place, like we said in the video, and uh, youth is the voice. So, like, so online safety is an important thing, and especially now when everything is happening there with online school and everything, just remember the safety and. Yeah. Absolutely, Frida. Thank you so much. We're gonna now go um to Francisco. Francisco, your group also. Uh, developed a video and uh, worked also on a specific topic. Tell us which topic your group choose and why this is so important to you. Um, so good morning. We chose social networks and advertising. Our reason for this choice was that uh, as time goes by, social media becomes more and more ingrained in our lives, um, in politics, in economics, socializing. Everything is done through social media nowadays. And it's a good thing. Social media is a very good tool. However, we feel that there are some things that aren't done in the best ways possible. And we as youths want to advocate for changes in some policies. That's why we chose this topic. We feel that it's very important and it has a lot of impact on everyone from youths to older people, elderly people even. We feel it's very important. That is with no doubt very important. I would say let's also have a look um, at the video. I remember the first time I was curious. At the time, I needed a new computer. I've been doing some research and surprisingly seeing more and more ads about computers. I had just recently bought a new smartphone and after some days, I started noticing that the ads I got were for stores and businesses located nearby the places I've been to. How is this possible? Checking the settings of my smartphone, I noticed that the geolocation was active by default. One day I was talking with my friends about some sneakers and the same day ads with similar models popped up. I thought it was a little bit strange because I had never searched for them in my browser. So wonder, where does our data go? Who has access to it? Why is it being collected? Reading through the privacy policies really helped with nothing, as they were either so long that nobody can read them, or they're so vague that we read them and learn nothing valuable. Knowing how profitable this data is for the people behind screens makes me believe that all kinds of methods are used to retrieve said data. So are these platforms still just helpful and convenient friends? So considering this, we believe it's time for some change. We believe one of the essential changes that must occur is the creation of a more digestible data policy so users are more aware of what they're signing up for. 
After some reflection, I pondered, is it fair that geolocation, as well as all the other systems that potentially expose our data, are active by default? Should users be pre-assured to use systems they may not want to enable? I believe instead that users should give clear consent to use them after being totally aware of how their data will be collected and processed. And to our governors, if companies are not compliant, embrace and fund free and open source software so that the software that is compliant with the privacy policies gets more support and usage. Today, we start changing things for the better. Congratulations also to you, Francisco, and uh, your group. This was another amazing video. And let me just remind our audience that the young people have developed these videos all by themselves. They have written the script, they have edited, they have put everything together. Really, really amazing resources that you have produced here. And again, also your group, um, a clear call for action, a clear call for change. You have raised a lot of important questions uh, in your video. Um, before we move ahead, also one question from you. You know that uh, amongst our audience, we have a lot of important people from the policy area and from industry on our call. Um, maybe also for you, one or two points you hope our audience will remember when um, developing their policies and working on uh, new products. Um, okay, so I discussed among my group and one of the main points that we wanted to advocate for was transparency in privacy policies. We feel that uh, privacy policies either fall into very extreme categories. They're either very complex and over, overly detailed and normal people like me and you and most of us can, can't read them, can't make anything out of them. And there are policies in the other extreme that are so vague that there's really nothing to be learn from them. So we feel that it's possible and we know that it's possible because it's already been done. Uh, we feel that it's important to reformulate vague policies to have clearer wording while still uh, reformulating the harder to read policies to be less, less complex, less loaded. We also feel like um, users should have the option to opt in or out of features without being constantly pressured by an application because we know that while we can disable cookies or disable geolocation the app will be constantly be asking to re-enable it and feels like we know we give you the option but we don't condone it so in conclusion we want users to be able to consent knowing all the ins and outs of their data flow Thank you so much, uh, Francisco. You pointed out very clear, more digestible data policy. This is uh, what uh, young people need and young people want. Thank you very much to both of you for being with us this morning. Uh, I hope you can stay and continue interacting with our the audience who are definitely thrilled uh, to hear more from you. Thank you so much. Um, moving on now and uh, actually staying um, within this topic, um, our next panel discussion now will look uh, more into detail on the topic of protection. And this panel will be shared by June Laurie Kingston. Good morning, June. Uh, welcome. Um, June is the head of unit for accessibility, multilingualism, safer internet at DG Connect of the European Commission. June, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Good morning, everyone. And I hope you've enjoyed the morning so far um, as much as I have. We're on another roller coaster for the next hour. We have two great panels. As Sabrina said, we're trying to hear as many voices as we can. Um, obviously, we've heard youth participation, which is so important to us. But now we are looking, as we said, policymakers, uh, industry, and our own very important uh, hotlines and safer internet centers. So I'd like to introduce our three panelists for the panel on protection. So Marta Coulion, my colleague from DG Justice, working on the rights of the child. 
Alexandra Evans from TikTok, Voice of Industry, and a very popular platform we know with young users, and Christina Krulic Kuzman from our Safer Internet Center in Croatia, particularly from the Helpline, which is a great resource for all parents, families, and children across Europe. If you don't know them, look them up and use them. So, ladies, I'm going to give you uh, lots of homework for the next 25 minutes, 20 minutes or so. First of all, from each of you, I would like, I'm going to give you about four minutes to present what you see from your point of view as the key sort of priorities and actions at the moment concerning child protection online. And then I'm going to follow up with an interesting question, I hope. So, Marta, let's start with you from DG Justice. Four minutes starting now. <laughs> Good morning. Um, uh, thank you very much, Frances Francisca and uh, Frida, for uh, setting the scene for today and for the yesterday session that uh, I had to reconstruct a little bit this four minutes that I <laughs> prepared before. But it's a good thing to adapt to, uh, to new information. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to say that um, for, for me personally, it's a little bit difficult to um, disconnect the protection from empowerment because I see it as, the, as they, they go hand in hand and there are the two sides of the same coin because the protection allows for empowerment but the overprotection can also, also kind of stop the empowerment. Um, important issue that I wanted to say today and it was also said before is that um, we need to look at the rights of the child online as they apply offline. And I think it's particularly difficult for, uh, for us adults because we're not uh, digital natives. We, uh, we had to learn everything when we were at a certain age. So it is very much disconnected. But when we talk about the rights of the child, those that apply offline, they apply equally online and that uh, was underlined also in the general comment 25 uh, issued by the committee on the rights of the child and it goes hand in hand in what was said yesterday uh, that uh, when children said that how you uh, behave online depends on the offline environment you grow up in depends on what you learn offline and the type of relationships you have uh, in an offline world and that's what you bring with you online and another uh, thing that uh, children mentioned yesterday is that just as in the offline world, the online will never be 100% safe. And I think that we have to have this uh, at the back of our head when we look at how to make the online environment safe. Um, and this is what we had at the back of our heads when we drafted uh, the EU strategy on the rights of the child. And when uh, we read the report that came out from the consultations with children ahead of the strategy. And that's why, uh, although we do have a separate uh, kind of chapter or thematic area on, uh, on digital environment, we see uh, the rights of the child online very much interconnected with, uh, with each other. So be the right to education, right to be protected from harm, right to be, her be heard, uh, the efforts to combat poverty or to combat discrimination online and offline. And this all requires multi-stakeholder cooperation, as it was also said today. Um, I would like to maybe focus on one aspect uh, and one important factor that contributes to create a, a safe space. And that was mentioned today by, uh, in the videos that we, that we just seen. Um, it's about knowledge, awareness, and about creating space for, for dialogue, for listening to each other. And that uh, brings me to, uh, to the importance of child participation. Uh, we've heard yesterday that children feel that politicians and adults do not listen about children's experience online. And that echoes what we've heard before the strategy, when only 10 to 12 percent of children uh, who re replied to our own online survey said that they felt that local authorities or national governments ask for their opinion when taking decisions that affect them. So with this in our heads, what we uh, hope is going to 
uh, bring the situation forward is the EU children's participation platform that we are working on currently to set up. And this will be a platform that will bring existing child participation mechanisms together to better learn from each other, to better listen to each other as well, and to, to think about, you know, collectively uh, what needs to happen both offline and online to uh, make uh, both kind of environments uh, safer and more fulfilling for children and young people. Um, and we were hearing also the call to uh, create more transparency and uh, reformulate vague and hard to read policy, uh, privacy policies. We started with the strategy on the rights of the child and we created child friendly and accessible versions of the strategy. We did it together with children and, um, uh, and we have now three three versions of the strategy, including an easy read version that was uh, um, drafted together with children with learning difficulties. And that we are working currently on the translation into EU or, or EU languages. So I'm going to post the link in the chat. So this is how we approach the um, bringing information also closer to uh, to those who are most interested in getting this information or the, the information that affects them most. Um, so I hope that we will take with the platform and with all other actions that are under the strategy that we will implement the call for action uh, from that we've heard yesterday and today and we will stop uh, villainizing the online um, space but start creating inclusive and safe space and we will listen uh, to children and young people how they see it happening and, uh, and we will create more digestible data policy and policy and legal documents that affect children's lives. Hope I managed in four minutes. Well, I didn't cut you off, so thank you very much, Martha. And in any case, it was so interesting, the child platform. Um, I think that's a huge development, and I hope reassures our younger listeners that actually this commission is really committed to youth participation, and actually we're putting our money where our mouth is. It's not just fine words. We're really seeing actions on that, and totally recommend the child friendly versions of the, the general, the comprehensive strategy on the rights of the child, which is a great achievement. Um, so because we're pushed for time, I'm moving swiftly on to Alexandra Evans from TikTok, as we know, a very popular tool for younger users. Alexandra, in terms of protection for those younger users, what is TikTok up to? What, what are you working on? Hi, Jean. Hi, everybody this morning. Yes, I'm conscious that we um, are on schedule, so I'm going to try and stick to my four minutes. Um, uh, but I just want to quickly give you a sense, as Jean says, of, like, of what we're doing in terms of keeping our community safe and what that means for the way that we design our products and our policies um, and the decisions that we're taking. So I think that the first thing to say is that a key part of our approach to safety is implementing safety by design principles. And, um, and an example of that is the way that we have designed our direct messaging service. So you can't on our direct messaging, which is our private uh, messaging function, share off platform images or videos. Um, and this was a really deliberate decision that we took on our part because we know that you know, that studies have shown that private messaging, despite all of its benefits, is also linked to the distribution of child sexual abuse imagery and material. So we've just taken a safety by design approach and just prevented the possibility of those images being shared. And it's also a, the way that we think about unwanted contacts. So again, if you want to use our direct messaging service, um, you have to be friends with somebody, which means that both sides have to decide to connect with each other. Um, but as well as safety by design, we're also really committed to thinking about what it means to be a teen on, on platform. And I think that what Martin has said about that need to balance participation and um, empowerment is a, and protection is absolutely critical. So you know, we absolutely believe that teens have the right to participate in the digital world and that feeling safe is essential to full participation. And we believe that the digital world has to be designed with young people's safety and best interests in mind. And we welcome the fact that things like the General Comment 25, um, but also things like the UK's age appropriate design have, um, have created a, a renewed focus on, on this issue. Um, and at TikTok, we absolutely get that the young people using our platform, they're still learning and they're definitely still growing. 
and we think really carefully about what additional support they're going to need to um, use TikTok safely and then we design the platform accordingly. So essentially our goal is to um, ensure that the platform is age appropriate by design and we're making those decisions based on our understanding both of childhood as this protected phase of life but also on a collective understanding of childhood and adolescent development. So another example of that is that I mentioned that for direct messaging you there are limitations on how anyone can use it irrespective of age but for under 16s we've actually disabled the feature entirely and for 16 to 17 year olds so late teens and um, we've made it default off so that you have to make a decision about who you want to be able to send you a message um, uh, no one or your friends um, another examples are we don't let under 16s host live streams and you have to be 18 to send or receive a virtual gift on TikTok. And also um, in January this year, we announced that all um, under 16 accounts would just be private by default. And that's a decision that we took globally and we applied it to all existing users as well as new users. So in, that's our approach to age appropriate design, but also we really want to work with families as well. So we know that obviously there are some parameters that we can set, but that of course, you know, everybody, um, every family is different. And we know of course that the first line of defense for keeping young people safe online is typically uh, their parent or their caregiver. So we've invested really heavily on our in our family um, safety tools um, and we try to make it as easy as possible for caregivers um, to be engaged and uh, interested and understand how their child is using our platform. Um, so our family pairing feature enables you to essentially link your account to your teens and then you can work together to make decisions around how uh, the team is using TikTok, so things like screen time, how long they're spending on the platform, comment setting, private account settings and things like that. But again, to Marta's point about making that balance between participation and empowerment, um, uh, we're absolutely clear that this just is not a monitoring tool. You know, absolutely teens have the right to privacy, but it is, in our view, appropriate for them to be able to work collaboratively with their parents to set the parameters. So, as I say, the I can't explain our entire safety strategy in four minutes, but I just kind of want to reiterate that safety sits at the heart of everything that we're doing. Um, and that obviously we're completely aware of the fact that there's never going to be a finish line on this. Um, but it's really um, uh, just it's it's a, a sense of, um, you know, a pride that we are moving as fast as we possibly can towards enhancing our, um, our strategy. And in particular, I think it's interesting that, you know, from a transparency point of view that TikTok uh, made the decision earlier this year to um, not only think about how we're doing age group design, but what we're doing to keep young people off our platform who shouldn't be on it, who are under 13. And we um, announced that we, in fact, removed over 7.2 million accounts globally um, uh, in the first three months of this year for being suspected underage. So for us, it's about balancing participation, empowerment, and and also ensuring that we are making sure that if, if our if we are being that thoughtful about age appropriate design, we must equally be thoughtful about ensuring that those who are not old enough to use our platform aren't able to um, to come on platform. Thank um, you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I hope that replies to one of the questions that we've seen in chat saying what measures does TikTok take? If we had more time, I'd love to hear more about the age verification mm -hmm. so that you can be sure that those, mes those uh, measures for the 13 pluses actually apply to 13 pluses. But we're moving swiftly on again. Maybe you can put something in the chat about that um, because we now have someone who's really at the coal face of um, safer internet protection, who is Christina oh. krulich Kuzman from our Croatian Safer Internet Centre and from the helplines, which is where families, children can phone in or message in to ask for help when they're in tricky situations. So, Christina, I'd love to hear from you as to what you think are the priorities for protection. Yeah, thank you, uh, June. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, I'm really am honored to be here on behalf of our organization. Uh, I would use uh, only a few minutes just to sa say what we are doing uh, so far, just so that you be able to see uh, our uh, starting point. So, as you, some of you already uh, know, I'm from Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Croatia. This is a non-governmental organization which is running our in our country. Um, our organization was established in 2006 with the main purpose to protect children and youth in online environment. But since then, our scope of work had significantly expanded. So after 15 years of work, uh, we can now uh, 
say that uh, we have four main pillars of work. One of them is online safety. This this is something that we are going to deal with it uh, today. But we also provide support regarding missing children problem. We run 1160 hotline for missing children. We uh, were running a national sh uh, shelter for children victims of uh, trafficking. Uh, we have a long tradition uh, of work in the field of protection of children's rights in different uh, fields. Um, the third pillar of our work is provision of social services for children and families. So on a daily basis, we work with more than 100 children uh, and youth in the risk and children and youth with behavioral problems um, to our day accommodation. We have a half day accommodation treatment. Uh, and the last pillar, but uh, definitely not the least, is our prevention uh, actions. Uh, we find it very important because we are uh, developing prevention programs and prevention activities regarding all forms of uh, prevention of all forms of violence against children, among children, prevention of addiction and different forms of uh, risk behaviors. Uh, our team consists of more than 20 experts uh, in different fields such as uh, social work, social uh, pedagogy, psychology, law, criminology, and we are providing support and help to children, youth, parents, teachers, uh, experts on a daily basis. So definitely for this panel is the most important our work in the field of online safety, which started in the year 2006, but formally we established Safer Internet uh, Center creation in 2015 and we became a member of this international community. So our organization is the organization who is running helpline, hotline and awareness center, uh, which everything is under one roof. And although as you um, presented me, my work started in the field of uh, helpline. I started as a helpline coordinator. Uh, currently, I'm more involved in awareness raising activities and more involved in educational activities for children, youth and uh, uh, so our top priorities is to provide direct help and support the children to youth uh, family members. We developed a lot of innovat uh, innovative tools and materials regarding online safety. So, so far we developed uh, guidelines for uh, online uh, violence of children on how to behave when child is a victim of cyberbullying. We developed uh, working books for children, uh, fairy tales for preschool, board games, mobile applications, so different tools tools, different materials for children and for parents and for experts. Uh, we are continuously organizing educational activities for different target groups in order to put their skill and their knowledge on the subject and to raise their awareness. And um, what we noticed in the last few months, which is really worrying us, is a growing trend in the air of uh, impaired mental health of children. And I think this is something that other panelists wouldn't uh, uh, talk about more. So this is something that I would address uh, more directly. Uh, we noticed that more and more children uh, are in need for psychological counseling and uh, in more need for psychotherapy and mental health issues that they are coming to us with are more, more diverse. So we have uh, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, um, obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, a lot of fears, a lot of different behavioral problems. Unfortunately, their clinical picture is more and more complex and the levels of needed interventions are more demanding. Unfortunately, the current uh, COVID-19 situation made it even more difficult. So to conclude, I think that the online safety of children and youth, the upcoming period will be especially challenging for all professionals involved in prevention and treatment because we need to further invest in awareness raising and education regarding online risk behaviors, regarding media literacy, online safety. We need to develop more uh, guidelines, more uh, data, data protection policies, more child-friendly materials. But furthermore, we need to ensure uh, that new services and new materials uh, for uh, protection of mental health and children and youth are available and we need to be together with, with our children, with our youth, with our parents, family members, and experts and relevant stakeholders. I agree with everyone that um, talked before me. Uh, children really have a right to participate. On the other hand, we really have an obligation to make the environment in which they are participating safe. Uh, one of uh, uh, youth panelists mentioned curiosity, and I think that we need to ensure that uh, children are safe 
why be, why uh, being curious because curiosity is really important uh, in um, uh, their future but we we our responsibility is to ensure that they are safe while doing it okay thank you very much um and you know well done also on the great work that um that all the help helplines do across Europe. Thank you so much. We are very short of time, so I'll just mention that it's great to see the questions coming in in the chat. Many of these questions will be treated also at the deep dives, and I'm um, trying to encourage the speakers also to answer in the chat if they possibly can, because now I want us all to have a collective act of imagination, and this goes for our audience as well. If I gave you a magic wand and you could each change one thing, uh, to help children stay safer online. Could you, in about 60 seconds, tell me what that would be, why it's important, and who would be making the change? So we have a magic wand that's got a label with it saying this person is going to change. Um, Marta, could we start with you, please? Sure, okay, 60 seconds. Um, I would um, make, uh, internet and also physical devices accessible for children on one hand and uh, for all children so to make the uh, online world accessible for uh, all independently from where they live and you know what social uh, economic background they they come from um, why because i believe that if uh, something is not accessible then it becomes it really is for, for kind of forbidden fruit and it, it, it lures in a kind of different way than when it's presented out there, when it's uh, accessible and when children can learn about how to do it safely. And a, a mental, and I would also focus on mental accessibility for adults, uh, for them to be open for new experiences and focusing on how children also experience the online world and uh, interact and discover uh, the safe way to, to be there together with uh, children. Very good. You see, you fit two things in in 60 seconds, so thank you very much. And of course, for all our audience, you're very welcome to take part in the survey. The link is in the chat and give us your killer idea, what you think needs to change. So, Alexandra, I'm going to move to you next. The magic wand, what would you change so that by 2030, something is very different? It's a very, very good question. I think that I would add a, an additional layer of complexity, if that's all right, which again, <laughs> this is not what you want to hear in 60 seconds. But Martha's point is a really good one. Empowerment and protection is a very difficult line to walk. And it's sort of the Goldilocks moment when you're not too, not too hot, not too cold, just right. But the additional complexity is that that balance and the equation changes depending on the age and the capacity of children. So we all know that we need to move away from binary 13. You're an adult de facto. You can be online as you would. And TikTok has done a lot to ensure that our service is age appropriate. But the more that we can fully align the design of our service with what young people are able to understand, what they want, what they what they feel is their right in terms of participation, the better. So I think the only way that we can properly, as people who are more older than younger, uh, is probably the polite way to describe all four of us, um, is to bring young people into that conversation. So how can we properly have young people be front and centre in the decisions that we're making about how to design a digital environment that is not infantilizing them, but also is not asking them to perform as if they were adults um, uh, rather than adults in waiting. Thank you very much. And so, Christina, over to you for your magic wand moment. I'm sure I'm not uh, going to be able to put it in two minutes, but I'll try uh, because I think it's really a tough question. I'm sure that every one of us here working in the field of online safety would generate a list of things they would like to change about children's experience on the Internet. So although I would really like to have magic on and protect every child from any form of violence and harm, this is something that needs to be addressed on several uh, levels and really is responsibility of every human being on the planet. So from my perspective, as an expert, directly working with children and youth, you, if I have to choose just one thing, I would choose that every child, once he became a part of the online community, the moment he or she enters the online world, world have enough knowledge and skills about online risk behaviors, 
issues, online safety, their rights, and who to contact in case they need any support or help. So just imagine that every child, the moment he opens a profile on social media or uses the internet, is aware of potential risks in online environment and how to address them. I think it would be really great and our work would be, would be much, much more easier. So I choose this because, to be honest, uh, this is something that every Safer Internet Center is doing on a daily basis. And with the financial and logistical support on national and international level, this is something that is possible in the near future, not in 2030. So we, re we really can have a society in which from early childhood, childhood children and their parents are prepared for digital jungle. Our responsibility as Safer Internet Center is to develop new tools, new resources, organize educational activities for different target groups and establish cooperation uh, but unfortunately we can't do it alone we need support from parents we need support from other experts from different agencies and ministries and we really can have a community in which our awareness raising activities are adequate our own time appropriate to different age appropriate to various abilities of children and most of all useful to children and yet Great. Well, thank you all very, very much. As you said, the other side of the coin from protection is empowerment, and that's exactly what we're going to do with our next panel. So thank you very much, Marta, Alexandra and Christina. And I'm now very happy to welcome to the digital table another Marta. You don't have to be called Marta to work for the European Commission, but um, it obviously helps in certain cases. Uh, Marie Enemak Olsen, from a director from the Lego Group, and then Molly, one of our big youth youth panelists, and Giuliano De Luca, who is a very uh, interesting educator. So from that uh, going into school's point of view, welcome to you all. Now we've got an even more ambitious timekeeping slot for you all this time, especially as people are going to be hungry by one o'clock. So we're going to take a similar pattern, but obviously we've got the four speakers. So I'll give you a short um, time, four minutes or so, to present really your priority actions in the area of empowering children. Marta, I should say, is from uh, the Education and Culture Directorate General, so looks particularly at digital education. Um, and as I said, Lego teachers and a youth voice. So delighted to have you here. Marta, can we start with you, please? Over to you. Excellent. Good morning. Marta Markoska from the European Commission, where I work on digital education. Pleased to be here. Uh, and I'd like to begin really by thanking for the rich work and insights that have come out throughout these discussions. I'm thinking about what Frida said, what Francesco Braca brought out. And I think it really speaks volumes, uh, not only about the reality of the digital world and the digital space we live in, but also the challenge areas uh, and which we bring back to our policy work, which I think is key. So it's been very, very insightful. I'd like to begin by sort of looking a little bit about acknowledging the fact that our younger people play a real pivotal role, um, I would say, in shaping and in leading our digital societies, our digital era. And it's really, we look to education and training and helping them find their voice and to see how best they can really make a positive contribution uh, to our societies through be it through digital citizenship and eventually you know essentially their empowerment now we we often speak about the opportunities and we know those are limitless when it comes to the digital world but you know we also need to acknowledge and keep in mind some of the challenges and the threats be it tackling disinformation cyberbullying online anti-radicalization and it's really our responsibility um, as policymakers, but also as teachers, as educators, as parents, as wider society, to keep our young people essentially safe and empowered. So what does that mean in terms of our work? So as many of you know, the, um, the European Commission adopted the new Digital Education Action Plan uh, the previous September, September 2020, and it essentially um, provides a real ambitious um, vision for the rollout of high quality digital education that is accessible, that is inclusive, and essentially that is available for all learners across Europe. Now within, the, within this action plan, we have two priorities. One really looks at what we call the high performing digital education ecosystem. So it's all this stuff to deliver on high quality digital, whether it's connectivity, infrastructure, pedagogy. And then the second part, which is really the importance of strengthening the digital skills and competences of young people. And this is where the empowerment dimension comes in. And when, when we look at digital skills and competence, we have to kind of also look at the importance of digital literacy. And by this, we mean everything from um, how our young people access information online, how they create it, 
how they share it, and helping them essentially become both, I would say, confident and critical users of what they see online in, in order to essentially provide them with a positive experience. And we have data. We know that there's a demand there. We have your barometer from 2020, which really suggests that about 40% of young people are of the opinion that media, digital literacy are not taught sufficiently in school. So there's a real appetite from our young people to learn more about how the digital arena works, to learn more about how they can be safe and empowered and for them to really develop those skills of cr critical judgment and assessments. Now within the Digital Education Action Plan, uh, I'm pleased to inform that we have a dedicated action specifically on this and it is to develop guidelines for teachers and educators on how to promote disinformation and tackle, sorry, how to promote digital literacy and tackle disinformation. And this is key. And in view of providing our teachers with guidance on this support, given that they are really, you know, the lifeline when you look at uh, education and training, providing them with guidance that is pedagogically sound, um, that is practical, but also looking to, you know, what's happening in the real world and how do we, how do we bring this into the classroom into learning that is effective and informed. And essentially for to deliver on these guidelines, we, uh, the Commission launched an expert group bringing together really a wide spectrum of expertise across Europe. So the tech companies, the broadcasters, journalism, civil society, uh, um, and, and the wider society, essentially, you know, the wider community, because we want these guidelines to be as as informed and as practical um, as they can be for our educators, and then obviously relaying this to, to our young people. Uh, in terms of timing, we will be adopting these guidelines next September, uh, so within the year, uh, as part of a back to school program. So we hope to, to to disseminate them and to really see them implemented widely across Europe ab about a year from now. And just in closing, these guidelines, obviously, this is a new deliverable that we have going, uh, implementing that will, will be rolled out, but it really already builds on a lot of the work in education and training that we've done to promote digital literacy to tackle disinformation. Um, as many of you know, the annual theme for e-twinning this year is media literacy and disinformation. So a lot of the projects, the annual conference, the, the sort of theme that runs through the work stream focuses specifically on this, which I think speaks volumes and also is a direct link to our teachers and educators and what's happening in the classroom. In terms of Erasmus program, uh, we have funded around 2,600 projects, the amount of around 240 million euro. Uh, so this is really direct work on, you know, at member state level with associations, with organizations focusing on this. And also through the European Solidarity Corps, we funded about 3 million or about 140 projects. So it's really speaks volumes about, you know, the bottom up mobilization of education and training and what we can do to promote digital literacy and help young people have a positive experience online through empowering them. Last but not Last but not least, I think the international dimension is very important. You know, when we speak of the internet and empowering people online, the internet is borderless. So we really need to look at sort of the global dimension and what this means. And we're proud, pleased to say that the Erasmus Plus virtual exchanges, uh, which provide sort of an online dialogue originally between Europe and the Southern Med uh, as a means to improve young people's soft skills through online learning, um, is also being expanded to include the Western Balkans, Eastern Partnership, parts of Africa. So going beyond the Southern so I think this is really important when we look at empowerment, uh, what we do in Europe, but also this speaks volumes for what happens elsewhere. Um, I, I, I tried to be as quick as I could. So there we go. That's it. Thank you very much, Marta. It's hard, I know, when there's so much going on, and I'm sure we can put links to some of those uh, documented initiatives in the chat in case people aren't familiar with them. Thank you so much for that. So moving swiftly on to Marie from Lego. Um, again, would you like to take the floor and tell us what LEGO is up to in the field of child empowerment, please? Yes, yes, uh, I will do. Thank you, June. Uh, and thank you for having me um, uh, and inviting me to this year's A Safer Internet Forum. It's great to be here and particularly great to, to hear some of the input directly from, from the youth here today. Uh, and also for, for us to be invited here, for the LEGO group to be recognized as a, as a key stakeholder is how it is that we protect and empower children online. So in the next four minutes or so, I'll just quickly um, share some reflections uh, from our end and share some examples of what uh, the work we're doing actually on, on children's rights, safety and, and empowerment online. Um, I assume most of you know uh, the Lego group, uh, most of us do and have played with it um, since uh, early childhood. Um, 
Our mission is truly to inspire and develop uh, the builders of tomorrow. Uh, and in our company, we talk about children as our role model. This goes with our classical products as you know them, but it's also a uh, goes with the engagement we have with children in our online digital play experiences. And we all know that children play online, they connect with friends, learn, gain information, they build new relations and, and much more. Uh, and we do acknowledge that that the potential that technology can have on contributing to children's rights and well-being. But we also know that that's only the case uh, if we an anchor this on children's needs and their interests uh, and that we design our experience around that. Um, our commitment to children's rights uh, and well-being is in the center of our uh, innovation with our digital design. Um, and uh, that's something we work on for, for many years. Um, we, we're clear that we cannot lift this ourselves, obviously, uh, and that's also why we're joining uh, forces with key partners in the area. As an example, I can share with you that we worked hand in hand with UNICEF since 2015 to implement and advocate for children's rights and business principles. And we've actually together have a, had a particular focus on implementing this across our digital play experiences. And we work to co-create uh, best practice tools on, on online safety as well. Um, and another important partnership that I would like to highlight today, in particular today, is a, our partnership with DQ Institute, a Singaporean institute, a world leading think tank on digital citizenship and online safety. Um, and today, together we work with, uh, with sort of with an overall ambition of equipping children and families uh, with digital knowledge and skills uh, they need in order to thrive in an online world. And I'm happy to share with you today, we're actually launching some new interactive experience or digital citizenship skill building experiences for children called Doom the Gloom. And we're also launching some other parenting tools exactly on the same topic. But on the, just a little note on the, on the kids experience that we're launching, it's a mix of mini games and interactive videos um, uh, that provide children with the opportunity to, to in a playful way, explore and learn about digital safety, um, and they are all available uh, for you also to go and, and, and check it out. Um, just a few other um, examples of partnerships, uh, again, to the note about not being not lifting this on our own. Just want to share with you that we uh, uh, one of our partnerships is the Digital Future Commissions in the UK, led by Baroness Kidron and Sonia Livingstone and other academics, uh, which is a, a key work of what we're doing at the moment. Just uh, also being mindful of time here, just as a closing, a closing comment here from my end, um, uh, I want to point out a core element uh, for us at the legal group, um, because we have digital play experiences out there and, and the core concept of what we do is safety by design, privacy by design. We've heard about that as well uh, earlier today. And one of the examples is, uh, is our Legal Life app, which is a safe and, and social app that we launched back in, in 2017 that are, that's ultimately built on, on, uh, on the, those two um, principles. However, building safe experiences is not enough. We also, uh, and protecting them is not enough. And we've heard that also many times today. Empowerment uh, uh, with children is equally important. And we believe that we have a responsibility to play a, a core role here. So skill building activities, empowering them, such as doom the gloom activities that I shared earlier, but also on some of the focus on, um, on, on parents is, is quite key. So we really welcome this discussion and, and understanding that uh, there are two sides of the coin here, uh, one on the protection and the other one on the empowerment. And I think that was my time. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, and I think it's also really important for all of us also to remember that although we, fo we focus a lot about social media and how children access uh, digital content that way, that for a lot of traditional toys, there is now an online element, as you mentioned, through your app. And this is a great way also to reach to children and to reach to families and parents. Um, so perhaps you can also share some of those links. And uh, if people aren't familiar with that, they'll be there. So I think... Um, we're going to Molly next. If not, I can go to Giuliano perhaps next. Molly's coming. Hi, Hi. Molly. There we have Hello. you. Hello. Most important person on the panel. So Molly, 
four minutes for you to talk to us about what does it mean to you empowering young people online? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity as well. First of all, I'd like to talk about like education. I feel like a lot of people in our age group don't feel like they have power due to education. We are like getting told every day that online is so important, but where is the education if it's so important? We go to school, we learn about important topics, but none of that, barely any, is on education. Maybe like an hour within a year, but it's nothing huge. So that's why I was thinking, why don't we have like peer education programs? Why don't we educate a certain amount of people that can educate their own age group? People learn best in our generation when they're hearing it from people of their own age, because obviously like learning from each other is a lot easier than learning from adults in a lot of cases for ch children, especially because there can be different ways. So I feel like peer, peer education is used in a way to make people feel empowered in our age group. That comes to policies need to be simpler as well in a way that when a 12 year old opens for the first time going on social media, and I'm sure they are so excited and I can't wait to see a 12 page essay pretty much of a policy it really really turns them off it and they just hit accept and they don't know what they've accepted and they don't know how much of their digital is gone like like how much their policies have been taking and how much they are going to see advertisements of certain things just because they're able to access so much and i feel like that's a huge problem because i feel like what 12 year old is going to understand words like artificial intelligence digital literacy there it's just it's not gonna it's not it's not practical i feel like there needs to be like simpler language for these huge policies that are such important may i add so important that there is these policies and i feel like if it was simpler and like a 12 year old could just go and see it in their own language they'd be like yeah that's great at least i know now at least i know my rights at least i know what i can say online and that will like save so much time as well when it comes to taking down things, things that aren't seen right. And it also gives the 12 year old so much more power. And that's just for example, in 2020, there was a 20% increase in online victimization, which is huge. Like cyberbullying is huge. And I know in 2020, like online, everything was online. But I think it's so mad to think that 28% because there was a 20% increase from 8% is huge and i think it's so mad to think that that many people that were getting bullied and victimized online and i think that makes people our age group feel they have no control they go online they're getting bullied with lack of like security online for them to feel they feel so alone and it's just it's just terrible and that's obviously increasing to mental health issues etc in 2020 these just needs to change like policies need to be stricter and there needs to be more maybe like employment in the policymaker that like I get that it's so hard and um, I put my hands up there it's very hard but I believe that if even the policies that were already there were stricter and were more put in place so for example like instead of taking one hour to get an article down it could be down within 10 minutes because there would be more people working on it because it is so important because the less hate seen online the less problems it will see and the more empower students feel like if they feel like they have the power to help people and they feel like they have the power that there's going to be less hate online and they feel like they have more control of what what's going on online that's when change really starts to happen. I personally believe that this can be done. I believe it's hard and I believe we need we need this change because who knows when another another online lockdown and when we're all online is going to come into that. And we don't want to be seeing 28 percent of people having online victimization, like online feeling like they have nowhere to go, feel like they have been problem, feel like they're bullied. I feel like that's just so big that we can't have that number next time. It has to go down. And I do think this has to be done together and let's do this together. Very wise words, Molly. Thank you so much for that. And I totally agree. I think if we had privacy statements and terms and conditions that a 12 year old could read, it would actually help everyone because it's not just 12 year olds who struggle with those legal documents. So thank you so much for that. So now I'm going to um, Jan Jan Giuliano, I beg your pardon, who is an educator. So someone who goes into formal education settings, but is not a formal teacher. I think you've got a very, very expert background for this with your IT law background, Giuliano. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on what we can do to maximize those opportunities, as Molly was saying, but minimize the risks. Hello, good morning, and uh, thank you for the invitation to attend this important event. Well, I, I start for a very simple uh, concept. Technology and the Internet are nothing but uh, tools. And uh, like every tool, they have uh, a great potential, but also 
some risks and uh, uh, we uh, have to be able to provide the right information to the kids. Uh, like uh, when I give my pen to my kids, I will say to them, you can draw, uh, you can write, but you should never throw it in the eye of your classmate because it's dangerous. In the same way, we uh, must be able to provide this information for the uh, new technologies and for internet too. Uh, I um, pose a question, are we ready to do this? I'm really not, not sure, not sure. In this context, I think that uh, digital literacy is uh, uh, essential. I paid attention to the survey and uh, I saw that uh, uh, the young people are asking us to have trained teachers. I'm of course uh, well aware that uh, so much has been done uh, in the past. Uh, in Italy, in my country, digital, digital literacy was introduced 15 years ago with the digital administration code. But uh, uh, I, unfortunately, I see mm, too much ignorance still uh, today. So we need to do uh, more. Digital literacy must become a cornerstone. And uh, uh, even today, uh, I see too many uh, single training events that lacks in continuity. Uh, so call it experts, and I think the student can witness this, uh, arrive in the school, have their uh, single uh, event of one hour, and then they will uh, disappear uh, forever. So my wish is that we can give more importance to uh, digital uh, education as mandatory subject in every school and we uh, can increase the role of digital uh, educators. We need to create and uh, Ms. Mrs. Markowska uh, talk was very uh, important for me. We need to create a structured and uh, uniform uh, training paths all over the uh, Europe. And uh, it's important to start to do reporting uh, about the results obtained, because only if we start to report all the activities, we can uh, generate a, a virtuous circles and we can realize the right follow up. Uh, about the follow-up, I want to say that is uh, another topic uh, touched by the survey. Uh, the students are asking for a follow-up for every uh, single uh, activity that we realize. And uh, uh, going on on this topic, this is the way, in my opinion, to plan uh, the future steps. Uh, in uh, realizing other training activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuliano. So I'm going to give the four of you the opportunity to wave that magic wand one more time. And again, to our audience, you can wave the magic wand and put your ideas in the survey. The link is in the chat. Um, Marta, can I start with you? If I gave you that magic wand, what would you change? I mean, we're hearing a lot about training for teachers, support for teachers. How can we test digital literacy? But magic wand for you, what would you do with it? Thank you. I mean, I will approach this with really from an education and training angle and trying to see what we could do essentially to provide a more positive and empowering experience for our people online. And I think there's one message I think, you know, it's quite simple, but quite clear is we can't consider it obvious that young people are necessarily digital natives and that they can navigate this world safe, you know, the online world safely. Yes, they were born in the digital world, you know, but it doesn't mean that they're equipped or digitally literate from birth. And really here we have to look at, you know, what does it mean to be critically engaged? Uh, what does it mean to develop critical thinking skills and a good understanding of the rules online? Um, 
you know, one in five young people lack even the most basic digital skills. That's 20 percent. I mean, that speaks volumes. We're not even talking about on the higher end in terms of, of, of the ability to assess and judge what is online. And here we have a collective responsibility, if I can kind of, you know, wave that magic wand. We look at educators and teachers. We look at formal learning that happens in the classroom, but also informal learning, such as what Molly had suggested in terms of projects, partnerships, getting young people involved, you know, shaping really that digital discussion together. We look at parents. You know, most parents, you know, they did not grow up during this sort of digital transformation. And they obviously, they often don't know how to have these conversations with young people. Um, so this is important, reaching out to parents. Also the tech world, uh, you know, including platforms and the responsibility they have when, look, when we look at the content that they post. Because a lot of this conversation begins with content and what's online. I mean, essentially is what are young people drawn? What do they see? And do they have the reflex to really be able to, to judge um, accordingly, interpret what that is? And these are sort of higher level cognitive skills. So there's there's quite a lot that comes into this conversation. And then the wider society, which I think brings together, you know, a lot of the people that we see today, industry, tech, civil society. So it's really a large conversation that needs to happen. I think it's happening, but there's obviously a lot more room and potential, but, but I'm, I think we'll get there. Okay, thank you very much. And I meant to say, uh, to reply to Molly's point when she made it, that I know that there are some peer um, training schemes and initiatives that are out there. So if anyone in the audience has ideas of that or can share links, please put them in the chat because there are some great things going on there. Same as Marta was saying, there are actually lots of great digital resources to help parents, but obviously we're seeing that it's not being particularly effective at the moment. Marie, over to you, magic wand into Lego. Yes, uh, at least I'll try. Um, I, I think uh, first, uh, to your question around, I mean, if we were to, what would change? I mean, what could we change, right? Um, there's no doubt that we can change things. Uh, so for any sort of future experiences for kids and every future uh, uh, play uh, opportunity for them in the online world going forward, that we can change with a core focus on children's rights in the design of what we do things. And when I say that it's not only, again, I mean, that's bringing in the focus on it's not only a matter of protection, we need to have the empowerment angle into it. And I think with that, it comes then we, we have then the opportunity to start considering sort of the, the age of the child and the evolving capabilities of the child. We can start thinking about impact versus risk and, and we can sort of broaden the scope around how it is that we design our experiences. Um, and, and that, as I see it, is, is in line also with, with, with the discussion in EU at the moment. And, and I hope that remains sort of being the, the, the path forward. And then I think I just want to comment on, or sort of similar to what Marta shared here, uh, there is this collective responsibility to start teaching kids and their families and, and, and parents and support in, in how it is that they thrive in an online world, giving them the skills. And I think it's not enough only so, as mentioned before to provide those safe platforms within those safe platforms you also need to use that opportunity to to empower them to teach them about um, safety uh, privacy um, about a uh, um, good online communities how to be good friend etc so using that opportunity to empower kids and give them the skills uh, within the platform okay thank you very much i see there's a couple more questions for you marie in the in the chat so maybe you could uh, reply to those in writing um molly over to you magic wand what would you do with it oh i definitely hope that there would be less hate that would be my wand. that would be my wand that on social medias and things it would be so much less hate because i feel like hate is the big problem as well i feel like when people like our age group, like especially younger as well as me, when they see hate and they see these slang words being used online, they don't understand that they can't use them because there's so many young kids that don't even understand what the words they're using and they just use them because they believe, oh, they're using them, why don't I use them? So I feel like that. And then I feel like that just comes down to like age protection, like policies. I feel like that just all comes into one. And I feel that's just so huge that there would be less hate on the line because in the end of the day, hate, like these things lead to mental health issues because people are getting hated on for things. It leads to suicide increasing. It just, it's just huge. Like the amount of hate that we see and it leads to bullying because once again, and like some cases, like people say things, like I said, from a young age, that they don't actually know what they're meaning and they don't actually know that they're hurting somebody, but they really are. So I feel like if we can try and control the amount of hate that is shown online and the amount of words that is used, that would be a key to getting down to the real problems and a real having a more security and have, letting young people feel more safe when they're online. 
that's a brilliant vision for us all to really hold there when we think where do we want to be a few years down the line thank you so much for that molly and giuliano last word to you if you could change one thing what would it be resources for teachers knowledge for teachers what would it be that you could that you would change one dream is find to find a way to uh, lock the access to dangerous content I think that is a, a very important uh, topic. Uh, harassment, cyberbullying, fake news, uh, pornography are all uh, things that uh, I think we, we will see the results in uh, next years. Uh, I, I think that the uh, um, uh, young generation are uh, growing up with a distorted conception of the society. They are growing up with a, distort, uh, a distorted conception of the uh, the woman. If they grow up with uh, full access to pornography, we will see in the next future uh, growing up the ear booze on the, the woman. Because uh, I start to think that what I see on my screen is uh, true also in the real world. And I will do my best to fight all this. Thank you very much. That's a very, very powerful way of ending it. And I think we, I see lots of nodding heads. I'm sure we all agree with that around the table. So it just remains for me to say thank you to our fantastic seven panelists. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sorry, it was very time pressured, but thank you all for making my job easy by respecting the time pressure. Thank you for the great ideas. And I hope we've inspired the audience to share that more ideas as well in the survey. And I hand back now to Sabrina. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, June, and to all the panelists for this like very brilliant conversation. Um, I think so much food for thought. And um, yeah, we are all eager and hungry to continue our discussion and especially saying the word hungry. We're just uh, a minute away from a lunch break. Thank you so much to everyone um, for joining us this morning for these wonderful discussions. As you know, the outcomes of the digital decade for youth consultations our discussions today and also the discussions tomorrow at the forum will all feed into the process of updating the Better Internet for Kids strategy. There's very important work ahead um, and yeah, we all need your contribution. You have seen the link to the survey that is still open. Um, please do go to the survey. We need your input. We need your contribution. So um, I do hope that you will all join us um, after the lunch break um, this afternoon as we're going into our first deep dive session. And um, Alessandra from TikTok has uh, stated very clearly the digital world has to be designed with young people. That sounds really promising. And this is exactly where this next deep dive session will um, continue the conversation on. It will all be about age appropriate design and the role of age insurance and verification. Here in this deep dive session, we will hear, we will hear again from colleagues from industry and also from uh, colleagues from the academic sector. So thank you so much everyone um, to all the speakers this morning for a fruitful discussion. We wish you all a nice lunch break. We will see you back online at uh, two o'clock Central European time. So a full hour to stretch your legs and relax. You should have all received the link uh, to connect with us um, at two o'clock. Please do keep an eye on your inbox uh, throughout this afternoon and tomorrow as we will regularly remind you with the right links to connect to your session. Thank you so much, um, everyone. I wish you a good lunch break and take care of yourselves.